This is a monthly forum hosted by Professor Ndemo, um, who you may previously have known as um, a member of government, uh, a stalwart of policy around ICT and so on, and currently a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. Um, and so this forum began about three years ago. Uh, Professor Ndemo was running, or still uh, writes a column, I think it's a weekly column in one of the dailies, and the feedback from his articles was that it can't end there. We need to have a conversation outside of just reading what it is that you're saying. And so Professor Ndemo um, began to look for a space where he could hold lectures monthly. And um, as fate would have it, he was at the time an advisor of the IHAB, still is. And so the IHAB asked if we could host him here, and he graciously agreed. And that is really the history of this forum. And so over the years, we've had several um, topics discussed, several awesome speakers, including the ones you're going to hear from today. Uh, so before I invite them, and I won't go through their profiles, because if you're here, that means you read your, their profiles, and then you decided that it was so uh, unique that you wanted to be part of the event. And so I won't go through their profiles. Um, but what I want to say is um, there's no real science around how we come up with the topics for each month. It's always just about what you want to listen to and the opportunities that avail themselves. And so this particular opportunity was really just our two speakers today walking into the iHub and saying we have something to share with the community. And then we began talking. And so my challenge to everyone here is, do you have a topic? You feel you are an authority in that topic and you want to share it with someone? Please talk to me after this and let's slot you in for one of the coming sessions this year or early next year. Um, how many read the news around the time when um, the then Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, visited the IHUB? Did anyone follow the news around that time? No? So a few years ago, um, Ban Ki-moon visited the IHUB, and it was a big deal. It was a surprise to many people, why was he coming to the IHUB? But I know he did, and I know why he was coming to the IHUB, because we do awesome work. I mean, allow me to brag. You know, and so <laughs> he was in town, and he passed by the IHUB. But the interesting thing after that was just days after he left, we began to get questions you know, and people wanting to dig into our records and find out how you registered and all this stuff, and is it a Kenyan organization and so on. And luckily for us, we had all our books in place. You know, everything was, we had ticked all the boxes, and so we, 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 were, we were safe. But imagine a situation, um, imagine if um, the president were to walk in right now and shake your hand and say, I've heard about the work that you're doing and it's awesome, and now I want us to work together. Today, Saturday. Believe you me, on Monday, the taxman will be knocking, wanting to find out, uh -huh, that thing Uhuru said, let me look at it also. So are your books in order, I think is the question today. And I'm glad that there's a good crowd to listen. Um, and so without much further ado, let me invite our speakers, Toddy and Lydia, um, to talk to us about taxes for SMEs. Karibu. I'm Lydia Njirangu, also of our eight years experience in tax matters, I'm very passionate about tax. And uh, why I'm passionate about tax is it's a topic that many people really don't understand or if they do, sometimes they just wonder why would the government tax us this much? Why are they doing this to us? And that's why you'll find many people complaining we're being overtaxed, all this is happening. But why I enjoy doing whatever I do in taxes is because I'm here to demystify it. Where people say it's complicated, it's hard, and for me, I look at it, it's like just having breakfast. 
for me. That's how easy it comes to be. And that's why I enjoy doing what I do, because I'm here to make it clearer, make it better. And as Albert Einstein said, the most complicated thing in the world is taxes. So if it was that complicated for Albert Einstein, I can imagine for all of us who are normal, yeah? Yeah, so that's why we are here today, to just bring it, break it down, make it more understandable, and make the session as interesting and uh, interactive as possible. So if you have any questions along the way that you may have, please just shoot your arm up and let's have an interesting conversation. Yeah? Jody? Thank you, Lydia. So I'll start off. I'll start off and uh, Lydia will come in later. Um, you also have the invite and uh, what you're covering today is tax management for startups and SMEs. So this is what we're going to cover today. We start with a great introduction. We look at the various business structures uh, for doing business in Kenya. We look at taxpayers' rights and obligations, the registration requirements. We have an overview of some of the tax taxes in Kenya. And then uh, from my experience, we picked up some of the common mistakes uh, that we've seen uh, that are made by startups and um, LSMEs. We'll take you through the recent trends in the tax space, both globally and uh, in Kenya, and we'll have some takeaways. So, without further ado, let's go to the introduction. So, Today we are looking at tax management, but I'm sure most of you have also heard of tax planning. But today we are looking at tax management. But it's important for us to understand also what tax planning is. So, does anyone know what tax management is? to your business and not only being aware of that you are also complying with that okay so if it is um corporation tax if it is pay -y, you know that you're supposed to be paying this uh, certain date and uh, you're actually doing that so that's tax management it's essentially uh, the act of being compliant with the tax laws in Kenya okay so then what is tax planning You can't say that's why you're here. <laughs> what is tax planning? Planning how to pay tax. Well, I, I think tax planning means uh, you, you need to look at your records, financial records, to see at the end of this year or at the end of the month how much tax am I supposed to pay. Well, that's still part of tax planning. But anyway, um, without complicating it, tax planning is essentially the arrangement of your affairs, of course, within the law. So it's the lawful arrangement of your affairs in a way that minimizes your taxes. Okay? So, of course, there, there are usually a lot of loopholes uh, within the tax laws. And if you can be able to take advantage of that, that's what we call tax planning, of course, within the law. Uh, for those of you, uh, you may probably have heard of uh, tax evasion and, uh, and tax avoidance. Those were the words. Uh, those are the words that are usually used. And previously, uh, tax evasion was illegal. It's still illegal because I mean that's just defrauding the, the government. And tax avoidance was legal. But currently in Kenya, tax avoidance and tax evasion are both illegal. So, tax planning is what was previously known as tax avoidance, which was legal then. So that's tax planning. So today we are going to cover tax management. And um, 
there's one quote that I like to use because sometimes you find um, most companies, especially the big corporations, they try to structure um, their, their transactions and, and their business in such a way that they minimize, um, uh, you know, they minimize the taxes that they pay. And of course, that's tax planning. But sometimes you find that some taxpayers concentrate so much about tax planning that you forget about the little things like filing the return on time, you know, just um, compliance, basically. So what I'd like to say is that tax management is actually the best form of tax planning. The reason why I'm saying this is because um, eventually you actually avoid uh, paying higher taxes. You know, you just end up paying the right amount of taxes. And of course, if you file your returns on time, if you pay your taxes on time, then it means that you're actually avoiding uh, penalties and interest. And we are going to see some of the uh, tax obligations that uh, people end up with. And if you don't comply, you actually find that you'll actually end up paying a tax that was not actually your tax. So it ends up being an expense to your business. So business structures. Um, there was a session to cover this, so I, I'll just brush uh, over this. Those are the different business structures uh, that we have. And of course, each business structure has its own uh, tax implications. Uh, for startups, most of the people, of course, they start with, uh, uh, with a sole proprietorship. And that's where you're just uh, alone and you start off uh, your business. And of course, it has its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. You are your own boss. But of course, uh, if you don't pay, for example, uh, your creditors, then uh, your liability is not limited, meaning that your personal assets also come into play when it comes to recovering your debts. Um, limited liability company. Of course, this is the structure that is uh, most common. There is private and public. For this session, of course, uh, private companies, uh, uh, we'll talk about private companies. So this is the limited liability company, and uh, right now in Kenya what happens is that you can actually be able to set up a company as an individual. Previously, what used to happen is that you needed at least two people for you to be able to set up a company. But now, instead of setting up a sole proprietorship, and we'll see why, uh, you should probably not set up a sole proprietorship. Uh, you can actually set up uh, a company as an individual. Then... Um, there is a company limited by guarantee and a non-governmental organization. These structures are preferred by the not-for-profit uh, organizations. So if you're, not, if you're setting up um, a not-for-profit organization, you can either set up an NGO or you can either set up a company limited by guarantee. Then, of course, there is a the partnership, uh, which is mostly used by uh, lawyers and uh, accounting firms. And the new kid on the block, limited liability partnership. So a limited liability partnership is actually a partnership, but the liability is limited. The normal partnership, the liability is not limited. It's the same as the sole proprietor, so the liability is not limited. But for a limited liability partnership, it's a partnership for all intents and purposes, but the liability is limited, just like the limited liability company. Okay? Are we together so far? Thank you. It's not hard, eh? <laughs> okay, so what are the rights and obligations of a taxpayer? And I think this is very important because um, sometimes you find that taxpayers are, are a bit, uh, I don't know whether to call them ignorant, but um, it's important just to understand your rights and obligations so that even when, for example, uh, the KRA comes to your office, what are your rights? Okay? They don't need to scare you. I know most of us are scared of the revenue authority officials, but yeah, we're all scared of the government, but um, you don't need to be scared. So we'll see what your rights are and, of course, what your obligations are. So the rights. The first right that you have is the right to information. And this is something that most people don't understand. You can actually call the KRA and actually ask them for advice. Okay? 
you can actually call the KRA and ask them for advice. So you can actually ask for information from the KRA for you to be able to understand exactly uh, what you need to pay. Uh, they, they, they have set up all those call desks nowadays so you can be able to get that. Then you also have um, a right to identification. If someone shows up in your office and they're saying that the KRA, you have a right to ask them to identify themselves and you can actually call back to the office and confirm whether those are KRA officials. There are a lot of uh, rogue people who are going, um, defrauding people of their money um, in the pretense of being revenue authority uh, officials. So in terms of audit, you also have a right to notification. So someone can't just show up in your business and say, uh, give us your books. You actually want to see what you've been doing. They can't do that. They need to send uh, an official letter, an official notification. Usually they'll say that uh, we want to look into your books in the next two weeks, so prepare this, this and this information. But um, you can always negotiate with them, write back to them and ask them, I probably need about a month for me to be able to prepare this information. So that's your right. Then um, in case they come for an audit and they raise a tax demand, you have a right to object. And in case they don't accept your objection, you have a right to go to uh, the tax appeals tribunal. Then of course, like I was saying, you have a right to pay the right amount of taxes. The right amount of taxes. And that's all about tax management. Just paying the right amount of taxes. Nothing less, nothing more. You have a right to be presumed honest. Whatever you are telling them, uh, if they have any suspicions, they will, have, they will need to have evidence uh, you know, for them to um, reject probably whatever you're saying. And uh, just, instead of just saying that you're not telling us the truth, they need to show you um, why they are saying that. So again, you also have a right to privacy and confidentiality. Whatever information that you're sharing with them should stay between you and the revenue authority. And of course, you have the, uh, the right to question the KRA. If they're asking you for something, you have the right to ask them, why do I need to provide this? OK? So of course, you also have uh, obligations. And all these are actually contained in the law, in the recently, not so recent, but uh, the Tax Procedures Act, which was enacted in 2015. So your obligations are ensure that you register uh, for the correct tax obligations. Uh, this is not so clear, but um, it's filing your returns and paying your taxes on time. Once you register uh, for, the, for the taxes, then you need to ensure that you're filing your returns, that you're paying uh, the correct amount of taxes on time. Then you also have uh, an obligation to provide accurate information and documents on time. So if the KRA issues a notice and they say two weeks, if you can't provide them within two weeks, you tell them probably I need a month. Uh, but within that month, then you need to ensure that uh, you have actually uh, provided that information. Um, then, of course, you have an obligation to keep, uh, to keep accounting records because that's what informs uh, the taxes that you actually need to pay. And then you have a right, uh, sorry, you have an obligation to be honest in as much as you also have a right uh, to be presumed honest, then you need to be honest with the revenue officials. Okay? Are we clear on the rights and obligations? All right. Um, so tax registration. I think tax registration is important, especially for startups, uh, because what happens is... Um, uh, and we've seen this with a lot of startups. Uh, some of them actually um, sole proprietorship. So you've started a business, and then you need, of course, you need a PIN certificate, so you need to do the tax registration. But the problem that people have sometimes is ticking the wrong obligations. You just go, right nowadays the registration is, uh, is obviously on ITAX, so it's a bit easier, not the days uh, when people used to go to cyber cafes, and, and I think then there used to be a lot of problems because the guy at the cyber cafe just ticks off all the tax obligations. So you find that you have a personal pin and you actually have a VAT obligation to file VAT returns. Okay? 
But of course, that hits you now later when you go into probably when you migrate into ITAX and it's telling you you have all these penalties. So we've seen all those kind of things. So it's important to know what taxes am I supposed to register for and uh, why do I need to register that uh, for those taxes. So these are some of the obligations when you get uh, onto ITAX that you'll see. Once you get a PIN certificate, whether it's an individual or, um, uh, or a company, then the income tax uh, obligation is actually automatic. Okay? That's automatic, and that means that at the end of the year, then you, you actually need to, uh, to file your returns. If it's an individual, uh, you need to file it, of course, by uh, the end of June. Then the next one is pay as you want registration, and this is for all people who have um, employees, so you need to register for pay as you want. If you meet the threshold for VAT, and we are going to see uh, what you need to do or whether um, uh, when you need to actually register for, for VAT. So if you meet the threshold for VAT, then you need uh, to register or rather to just tick off that uh, VAT obligation. Then there's also customs duty. If you are dealing in uh, imports and exports, then um, you also need to tick off that obligation. So you, um, a lot of people find themselves uh, just ticking off all the obligation, as I had said. Uh, and uh, what happens is that once you tick off an obligation, then you need to comply. Okay? You tick off, uh, of course, the income tax company is uh, automatic, so you need to be filing your returns. For PayYE, if you tick it off, whether you have employees or not, too bad. You need to be filing returns. Of course, if you don't have employees, then you need to ensure that you're filing nil returns, okay, until you get employees. VAT, the same case. If you've ticked off that obligation, you need to be filing nil returns if, you, if you're not making any, any VAT, so any vertable supplies. So uh, you just need to be ticking that off, even if it's your personal PIN. Because if you don't, uh, sorry, you need to be filing the returns. Because if you don't, then that penalty is still accumulating. So you find yourself in a situation where you've ticked off, inadvertently uh, ticked off, for example, pay as you want and uh, VAT. What do you do? Yes, sir. As you find new returns. <laughs> Okay, it's tedious, yeah, that, that's right, that's right. But uh, sometimes it can be uh, quite tedious to file nil returns, especially if it's your personal PIN, especially if you have a sole proprietorship, uh, you're going to be using your personal PIN. So it's hard to, to keep that track that you actually need to file returns. Especially if you have a personal PIN, you're going to think that all you need to do is just uh, filing, of course, um, the personal uh, income tax return. But there's something else that you can do. Sorry? Apply for dormancy. You're actually right. Can you go to the and edit the broker to remove? It's not as easy as editing the profile, unfortunately. You will think that just because you're ticking off the obligation, that once you want to get out of it, it's just checking off. Eh? It's not that easy. Uh, so she's actually right. Um, previously, what people used to do is that you needed to apply for the registration for that particular um, a tax obligation, or even for a PIN. If you want to register, to, let's say you're winding up and you need to deregister, you needed to apply for the registration. And what used to happen is that when you apply for the registration from the care, the first thing they're going to do is send you a letter and say, okay, we've seen your letter, you want to deregister from this tax obligation, but we want to come in and see whether you've been doing the right thing first before they deregister you. So fortunately right now, there's, um, you can apply for dormancy, and at least for dormancy, uh, it's, um, uh, they don't, the carrier doesn't need to come. You just go on your ITAX page and uh, you actually apply uh, for dormancy. So it's, 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 it's a bit much easier than, uh, than deregistration, okay? So, for example, let's say you have employees, you are doing a project and you need to, you, ha you have employees for this particular project. So you will need to register for, uh, for pay as you want. Uh, once that project ends, probably you don't need the employees anymore. You can actually just 
I put that pay as you an obligation on dormancy until you get an employee an, another employee. Okay? Yes, please. Sorry. So what happens if I employ a contractor? Sorry? I employ a contractor. Somebody is contracted to do the work. Do I have am I liable to pay no, if it's a contractor, you are not liable to to pay pay YE. But um, it's a it's a it's a bit tricky because then it depends how you are treating the contractors. Because some people, what they do is that you just enter into a contract with someone and say it's it's a it's a contractor's contract. But essentially, that person is actually an employee. They have a desk at your office. They have an email address. They are using your business cards. For all intents and purposes, that person is an employee. So it, needs, it depends on the relationship that you've defined. Yes, at the back? Does that apply for what you have demo? Once you come in, you'll be paid for the long time. If you're there is the, uh, what we call uh, the minimum amount that is actually taxable. If someone is a casual and you are paying them above that minimum amount, and it's for, like you're saying, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extended project, even if it's for six months, those guys are uh, dedicated to that project for those six months. So for those six months, you're actually supposed to treat them as employees. and They're actually supposed to be accounting for pay as you want, in as much as it may be painful for them, but that's just the law. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> of course, it doesn't happen. But that doesn't make it right, huh? Yeah, so good question. Any other question? Yes, please. Oh, sorry, volunteers. Um, yeah, if you're paying them, I mean, I would, I, I would still treat it the same way. If you're paying them, but I assume that volunteers, you're not paying them, right? Then you don't, then you don't need to register. Yes, please. Uh, about the dormant painting, is uh -huh. it something on the uh, on the item so you check off or what happens? Or is it a little right? What's that? Nowadays, actually, everything you do it on ITAX. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an application, but you make it on ITAX. But uh, even for the registration, you actually make it on ITAX. Okay? It's just that for the registration, they'll have to come for an audit. But for dormancy, you just apply and then, you know, it's just dormant. You're not going anywhere. Okay, at least that's what they think. Yes, please. Once you apply for dormancy, do you still do tax return? No, no need to. I'm just going to go back to your question about volunteers. Yeah. <clears throat> Perhaps I'm facilitating this volunteer. I'm paying for their accommodation, travel, meals, and it actually meets the tax threshold. Um, good question. Um, I think that also boils down, if, if this volunteer are treating them as an employee, it's a dedicated resource to you, and it meets those thresholds, then actually those become, uh, we are going to see, uh, th that's actually like taxable benefits. It's like the way an employer will provide for you housing, okay? Or providing for you meals. So it becomes a taxable benefit. So you're supposed to be accounting for tax if it hits the threshold. All right. So we are going to look at uh, the Kenyan tax system. And what we are going to do is that um, these are the various types of taxes uh, that we have. These are the ones that we are going to cover. The ones in red... Um, we are not going to cover, but feel free to ask any question if you have. So we'll jump right on to what are some of the incomes that are subject to tax. There is business income. And what is a business? So under the Income Tax Act, a business is defined as a trade, vocation, or profession, or every manufacture 
Um, every manufacturer <laughs> Let me help him out on that one. So for business, uh, how you plainly look at it, yeah? sometimes you can be thinking, whatever I'm doing, even if it's a hobby, it's not a business. And that's why they say it's any vocation, any trade, any manufacture you actually do, it's considered business. And uh, for business income, that, uh, that line of business has to be separate from employment income. And that's why for business, they look at it any extended thing that will gen generally generate an income. With that, you're considered to be doing business, and that's why this will be important for you. Thank you. Um, and of course, there is employment or services rendered, and the gentleman there had asked about contractors, so contractors will fall under the services rendered. And of course, the employment, the employee is also offering services, but you know, to one, to one person, not, he's not a consultant. Then there is rental income, dividends and interest, and basically any amount deemed to be the income of a person under the Income Tax Act. So it's, it, it's, quite, it's quite wide. The coverage is quite, is quite wide. So we are going to look at, uh, for business taxes, we are going to take an example of corporation tax, which is what will apply to, uh, to a company. So for corporation tax, um, so you've done your accounts at the end of the year whether you have an auditor or not. Maybe you have an accountant who just does uh, the management accounts. They give you the accounts at the end of the year. Of course, you need to determine uh, how many taxes am I supposed to pay. So the, account, uh, the accounts or the, uh, or, or the financial statements will have what we call um, the accounting profit. Okay? The accounting profit, but uh, for the accounting profit, you just don't subject it to... For example, the corporation tax uh, in Kenya is 30%. You just don't take that profit and subject it uh, to 30%. You might actually be having an accounting profit, and at the end of the day, what you end up with, you need to tax, actually, it's probably a loss. So we are going to look at how you arrive at what we call uh, a taxable profit. And the first thing you do for, to arrive at that, there are what we call um, allowable expenses. So in your business, of course, uh, you're incurring expenses. At the end of the year, then you need to determine which of these am I allowed to take a deduction off. Of course, you've already taken a deduction by the time you're arriving at, at, um, at, your, uh, at your accounting profit. You've already taken a deduction of your expenses. But then, if the expenses are not allowable, we'll see what you need to do. So allowable expenses are essentially expenses that have been carried wholly and exclusively in the production of your business income, for whatever business that you're doing, wholly and exclusively in the production of your income. That is the, that is the standard. Of course, the, the law provides uh, the different uh, expenses that, of course, are, are, are allowable. And, of course, we are going to see those that are not allowable. But if it's not expressly provided in the Act, then what you need to ask yourself is, is it uh, incurred wholly and exclusively in the production of my income? If it is, then it's allowable. Okay? So examples of these expenses, there are legal expenses and stamp duties if you're entering in a lease. Nowadays, there are no, uh, the 999 years lease, so all leases are 99 years and below. So if you're entering in a lease, the legal expenses and the Stamp duty for that, it's, uh, it's, it's allowable, but that's written off. It's allowable, but with a catch. There are actually some, um, some commissioners' guidelines, and uh, very difficult guidelines to, to actually meet. So what happens is that most of these bad debts written off, they essentially just become disallowable because uh, the guidelines are actually um, quite tough to meet and, uh, and actually prove. So there's also capital allowances. Capital allowances are, um, of course, in your business you've bought an asset. That asset is actually a, a capital expense, which you're not supposed, which you're not supposed to claim. It's a capital expense, which you're not, it's not allowable. Okay, but the law allows you to get uh, what we call uh, capital allowances, which you claim uh, over a period of time. We are going to look at uh, examples of that. 
Then if you incurred expenses, if you are starting up and you incurred expenses um, prior to the start of the business, then those expenses will be allowed if they, were, they would be allowable were you to incur them after the business has commenced. Okay? Sounds like a tongue twister of some sort. But. Um, one year. Okay. So one year. Then of course, uh, cost of any structural alterations to our premises, if you need to put in uh, fixtures and, and fittings. And of course, uh, if, if those are non-capital, uh, there are some fixtures that are usually, uh, you know, you can't really say that it's an asset. So those ones will actually be uh, allowable as an expense. Or maybe if you're doing some repairs and those repairs are not so significant such that uh, they contribute, you know, they sort of like replace an asset, then those actually become uh, allowable. Then there's also... Yes? So, just to clarify on the problem of expenses and cut by commencing the business, that means if, let's say, I want to set up um, a school, I decide to buy stuff before I start. Does that mean you mean that those ones will be? Yeah, the question would be, once the school starts, will it be an allowable expense? If it is, then you can actually claim it. Okay? Because you see, um, for, you, see you can start doing things before, uh, maybe even before the company is registered. Of course, you've probably started doing some trade here and there, okay? Before you get the company registered. Of course, once the company re is registered, then... The existence of the, of, of the company is from the date of registrations going forward. Anything that was prior, if you can actually claim it when the company is registered and you are doing business, then you can actually bring it uh, forward and, and actually claim it. So there's also donations uh, to approved organizations. Yes, please. So yeah, this, this, there's a gray area that you're allowed to work in prior to setting up your company. So you're allowed to trade without having a company. Um, I would think so, yes, because actually it says that, uh, you know, you can do that. But, of course, the most important thing is, you know, you're not just trading and you've not set uh, uh, the wheels in motion of actually getting a structure. The first thing you should actually, you should start thinking of getting a structure, okay? Uh, let me also clarify. Uh, here, what you're looking at are the expenses. So. What it's telling us is, let's say you have uh, preparation ex things that you have to do before you, the act, the, you start the actual trade, before you start business. Let's say you have to buy your furniture. If it is a school, you have to buy maybe the books before because you've gotten a good order before you've actually set up the structure. So how they look at it, one year back, if those expenses are expenses that you'd have normally incurred if you had registered and started trading, then you are allowed to claim them. Because it's like a grace period you're being allowed before you actually start doing the, the business is registered and it's up and running. Yeah? So donations. Uh, donations to approved organizations. Uh, donations, there are certain um, um, requirements that you're supposed to meet for you to be able to actually claim a donation as, as an expense. For example, uh, the company, or rather, the organization that you're donating to has to be uh, registered. Um, they have to have an exemption certificate. They have to give you a copy of that certificate. They have to give you a receipt. So you need to have all those documents in order for you to be able to, to do that. So you'll find that in most businesses, uh, probably the amount is, 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 is negligible. So they probably don't go um, the distance to get all those documents. So it will most likely, when you're doing your computations, donations are uh, usually treated as uh, non-allowable. Uh, do donations also fall in uh, other sponsorships? Yes and no. And uh, the reason why I'm saying that is for sponsorship, it depends. You can sponsor an event. But if you can actually be able to prove that uh, I sponsored this event, yes, but I had my banners there, you know, I was essentially uh, marketing my, my business, then you can actually get away with it as a, as a marketing expense. 
Yes. For another question, in many, for instance, if I receive money on behalf, say an institution wants to sponsor some face coins and they are abroad, and I get this money out of the business specifically for this person, and this money goes out to pay in that institution. So how does that come into the electricity of that institution? You see, um, that will uh, eventually sort of like, because when it comes, it's like you're receiving a grant income. It's not really, it's not really an income. You know, it's not really a business income. So, in the first place, uh, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be taxable, ideally. Okay. But then, if you're receiving ten thousand shillings and you're disbursing ten thousand shillings, I mean, it's a, it's a zero sum game. But ideally, you shouldn't. It's, it's a uh, it's a grant income because it's not a, that's not your business. Do I kind of need to maintain some kind of special documentation? It's important. It's important. Uh, um, it's important to get your records right, you know, so that it's not shown as if uh, okay. So I've seen you've paid school fees here, but you've not added it back. Do you have this documentation? So you'll just say, "This is what I received from this guy. This is the uh, evidence for that, and this is what I, I actually paid." the exact amount. The KRA are, are actually are keen to listen and uh, they will actually engage you. Yeah. On the first one, when you talk about electricity is part of the production of income, yes. somebody once mentioned to me about this lunches, accommodation, uh, team building, all those fall under that. They are allowable. If it's, uh, if it's not personal. If you're entertaining a client, if maybe a team is going uh, uh, outside the, the office and they need to, of course, they need to be accommodated, those are allowable. Those are business expenses. That includes outside of the country? Yes, it does. Okay, so I have a question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the we are going to look at um, the various types of capital allowances. So, of course, as I said, capital allowances, this is where you've bought uh, assets, and now you need to claim back that expense. So you don't claim it immediately, uh, sort of like, you know, just like any other business expense, which if you incur it this year, then you expense it uh, the same year. So for capital allowances, uh, we have various uh, capital allowances. The first one is investment deductions. And this, these ones are for uh, mostly manufacturing companies. So... For you to be able to claim an investment deduction, you have to, maybe you've built a, an industrial building, and in that building you've um, installed um, an industrial machine. So the cost of that machine plus the cost of the building, you can actually claim it, claim it back. Excuse me. Uh, the good thing about investment deduction is that um, the rate is actually 100%, so essentially it's like uh, you're claiming it uh, as an expense. Industrial building allowance, maybe you have some uh, warehouses somewhere, you've put up a uh, commercial property somewhere, you've put up a hotel, you've put up a, uh, an educational institution, you can actually claim an uh, industrial building allowance. Yes? Is that their period defined for that kind of deduction? Is that? A period defined for that deduction? You're actually supposed to, uh, for investment deduction and industrial building allowance, um, okay, industrial in, investment deduction is 100%, um, okay? You're supposed to claim it in the first year of use. First year of use. Yeah. Actually, all the allowances, the first time that you use them, then you start claiming them. If it's 100%, then you claim it in the first year. If it's spread over the years, then, of course, you carry it forward. Then there's wear and tear allowance, which is what uh, would uh, probably be relevant uh, for us here, because these are our computers, uh, motor vehicles, uh, maybe cameras chairs, furniture, and all that. So that one, those ones you claim them under, uh, under the wear and tear allowance. Then we have uh, another category called uh, soft furnishings. These are items that have um, uh, the, the diminution of its value is within one year. You know, it doesn't go uh, beyond one year. And most of them are probably uh, carpets. <laughs> Things like carpets, maybe curtains, uh, uh, loose tools, and equip and such kind of small, small equipment. So those ones are classified under soft furnishings. Then, of course, if you are a farmer, if you have the big farms, then you can be able to claim farm works deduction. 
mining deduction if you're in mining. So those are allowable expenses. So what is disallowable? We are still trying to come up with a figure that is going to be subjected to the 30%. So what is disallowable? What is disallowable, uh, the rule of thumb is expenses that are not uh, incurred wholly and exclusively for the production of income. So if you're in doubt of any expense, uh, just ask yourself, is it incurred wholly and exclusively, exclusively for the production of my income? If the answer is no, then it's disallowable. Like I said, capital costs uh, and, and losses, those ones, like we said, capital costs will claim capital allowance. So for example, if you're doing your, um, uh, if you're doing your accounts, uh, you have your assets. What the accountant will do is uh, depreciate those assets, okay? At a, a whatever, depending on your policy, depreciation policy. So that depreciation that they capture is actually uh, expensed in your books for accounting purposes, okay? But that's now a capital cost, which you cannot claim. But we'll see what, what you do with the depreciation uh, and what you do with the capital allowance. So, for example, maybe you've uh, been caught by KRA and then you've been told to, uh, you know, you've not been complying for a certain period and then they give you a demand, you pay that demand, you expense that amount, Next year, when you're doing your return, you need to disallow that amount, including any penalties and interest that, uh, that you've paid. Personal expenses, okay? For those who are going for trips and, uh, you know, if it's a personal expense, it's a, it's a personal expense. So you're not supposed to claim that. Pension contributions for those who have uh, employees, if you're, uh, if you're making contributions to uh, pension schemes, other than, um, other than the NSSF, if you're making contributions to pension schemes, those pension schemes needs to be, need to be registered. And if it's a registered pension scheme, they also need to give you that certificate of registration from the RBA, and they also need to give you uh, a certificate of exemption from the KRA. If you, if you don't have those, then it's an unregistered uh, pension scheme. Whatever you contribute for your employees, uh, you need to add it back. You can't allow it. Uh, then, of course, uh, the last one, donations, as we had said, if you don't meet the conditions for donations, then you add it back. Okay? So these are, yes. Yeah, okay. I skipped it, but uh, this is an, uh, you know, let's say for example, um, you've insured something, but you are supposed to be paid back. Of course, you see when you incur that loss, it, it comes in for accounting purposes, it comes in as an expense, okay? If it's not insured, then you can actually claim it. But if it's insured and you, are, you will actually get uh, compensation for it, then you can't claim it. How does it work? Um, I see some companies, for example, when you start the company to pay the school fees of the director, children, are those uh, personal expenses or they will come under the company since it's the company that is paid? They're not uh, personal expenses as such, but those ones are supposed to be treated as uh, a taxable benefit for the employee. Okay? In the strict sense of the law, it's a taxable benefit for the employee. So it's supposed to be added with your salary and any other benefits uh, for it to be subjected to pay as you want. But of course, you'll find that some companies don't do that. So when I'm coming in uh, as an advisor, and I need to, and I see that uh, you've actually paid some school fees. I'll ask you, uh, was this a tax on the employee? If you tell me no, I'm going to add it back. Not, be, not because that's necessarily the right thing to do, but it's just a mitigating factor. Because, for example, if the KRA comes in afterwards, I'll just tell them that, um, yeah, it was not paid by the employee, but I added it back, so it was paid by the company. It's just a mitigating factor, but doesn't make it correct. KRA can still claim pay on, on it. Yes? Sorry, I got lost somewhere in, yeah. in, in your terms. Uh, just clarify, allowable and disallowable. What do you mean when you say allowable and disallowable? 
um, just allow me to explain that in, in my next slide, probably it will be. So what we said is that um, we have the accounting profit, okay? You have your financial statements, this is, the, this is how much I've actually made, okay? The net profit. That's your accounting profit. For you to arrive at what we are calling uh, adjusted profit or taxable profit, which is what you subject to tax, okay? Um, you need to do the calculation, you need to do the assessment that we've done, the expenses that, remember by the time you're arriving at your accounting profit, you've actually already um, um, uh, deducted your expenses, okay? You had your gross profit, you deduct your expenses for you to get to your accounting profit, the net profit. So I need to ask myself, these expenses that I have already deducted, are they deductible? And that's what we are going through. If they are not deductible, then you take your accounting profit and add them back, okay? If they are not deductible. Take your accounting profit, you add them, add them back. Uh, and for example, what we'll have here, like I was saying, is something like depreciation, which you've said is a capital cost. You add back depreciation, and then if there's anything that had not been deducted in the expenses before, but it's actually allowable, then you, you deduct it. Okay? I don't know whether it makes sense or uh, I've made it more difficult. Yes, please. All right. Uh, my name is Alex. Sorry. And my question is uh, uh, parkings and uh, fuel. Is it allowable expense? If it's for the business, uh, yes, but there have been some. Um, uh, some debates as to whether parking, for example, if it's paid for the employees, whether it's a benefit. Okay, a lot of employers, of course, do not treat it as a as a benefit. But the good thing is that uh, if the revenue authority comes, probably th those are sort of like trivial issues that sometimes they can uh, they can overlook. Okay, maybe the exposure is not is not that big. The good thing is that sometimes there can be that trade-off, you know, you just tell them, I mean, this is, this is too small, or you just accept because it's too small for your business. But ideally, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a business expense. If you're going out there, you're going to meet a client and you pay parking, it's holy. Uh, what, what about uh, parking at the office, like the one free city council parking for even all the directors? For your business, you're going, you're, you're, you're going it's, a, it's an allowable expense for your business because those are some of the amenities that you need to provide. Uh, to your employees. It's, for example, like a desk. If I buy a desk for you, it's part of the amenities. But now the question comes is that, uh, especially the office parking, is it a benefit to the employee? Should it be taxed on the employee? Okay? Yeah. No, but you see that... No. Parking is the, is the space, and you need to provide it. You need to, I mean, there are some positions, of course, uh, you can't, uh, you know, you can't just tell someone to sort themselves out. Uh, it, okay, it depends on what you can or cannot do, okay? But if, if you can't be able to provide that, then that becomes a business expense. To me, that's a genuine business expense, okay? It's not personal. It's not personal, it's a genuine business expense. Now the question is, is that a benefit to the employee? That's the debate. Actually, the debate is not whether it's taxable, uh, whether it's a, an allowable expense or not. It's whether, is it a benefit to the employee? Okay? Yeah. Uh, there's a question on your previous slides. Uh, when we talk about donations to um, approved uh, charitable organizations, yeah. um, what, what, how do you determine that? And then a follow-up question is when you deal with, uh, with organizations, when you do business with organizations, which are taxes exempt, uh, like the UN and the like, when they pay you cash, is that income also exempt from tax? Yes. It, it, no, sorry. It's not exempt from tax because they are the ones who are exempt. You are not exempt. That's your income. Okay? And when I say uh, approved organizations, I, I mean they need to give you that certification. And what you need to ask for if you're dealing with such organization, if they are exempt, uh, you need to ask for um, uh, an exemption certificate. That's one of the things that you need uh, to get from them. Of course, you can't get an exemption certificate if you're not 
already an approved uh, charitable organization. So once you get that and you have maybe the receipt, uh, that, that should be enough proof that this is a, uh, it's, a, it's actually an approved charitable organization. Yes, at the back. No, 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 no. Um, this is uh, for income tax only. Okay. If you remember the introduction that I did uh, about the different types of taxes, VAT is actually uh, a different type of tax, and we are going to look at that. This is only for income tax. What do you consider your income? Okay? Yes, please. Uh, just to follow up on this question, if you have a vehicle, do you claim the fuel or do you claim a minus expense? A personal vehicle? If, if, if it's a personal vehicle and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's your business, then you just need to, uh, to sort of like uh, maintain a, a log. You know, just be honest. And if you're going for a business meeting, if you're using it uh, within uh, your business, then you can, actually claim, um, you can actually claim the fuel or you can actually claim the mileage. But, of course, for the mileage, uh, there is what we call uh, the AA rates. Those are sort of like um, the applicable uh, and acceptable uh, rates. You might have your own policy, but you might find that someone from the KRA, if they come in, and if your policy is claiming uh, 500 shillings uh, per mile, they'll definitely tell you no. You need to claim 50 shillings, OK? So it needs to be reasonable. So if you're, if you're on your own, then you can actually use uh, the AA rates, which are actually available uh, in their website. Uh, follow up question. If you do that over Time. Would that then be considered as personal income for the use of my income? So whatever you're claiming from business, then uh, because the area rates are standard, uh, they're slightly higher uh, no. than maybe than what it would cost. Okay. Uh, because they build everywhere and there and stuff. Okay. No, it's not it's not an income. That's not an income. You just claim it as an expense. You will claim it as an expense against your business income. So it doesn't become, um, it doesn't become like a, uh, is it, it doesn't become like an employment income. For example, if you're an employee and you're claiming mileage, it's, it's, it's not an income. Okay, it's an income, but it's not taxable on you. As an Just to add on that, uh, why you're being given mileage is more of a reimbursement. Because uh, let's say you're the top official, ideally you'd have, if you are a normal, um, normal employee, somebody can even tell you, take a matatu. So if you are to go pay the matatu 50 shillings, then you go to the office, they give you 50 shillings. It's, nil, it's, it's a reimbursement. So similarly, when you're claiming your mileage and why the AA rate is used, because they're assuming if you're just going to use your car, it's not only fuel, there's depreciation on the vehicle. So that's why they give you the AA rate. So even when you're claiming the mileage, it's more of a reimbursement. And why it's always safer to use mileage rather than fuel, what they usually say is uh, if you're the MD of your company and you're not a marketing person, why are you being given fuel allowance of 5,000? 5, 5,000 should be fuel allowance for somebody who's going door-to-door -door marketing, because they're always on the road. But as the MD, the places maybe somebody will say is, you're going home, maybe one meeting in the week, and, you're, and that's it. So it's even safer for the big guys, let them claim uh, mileage. But for the marketers, those ones who are going door-to-door, -door, that's when you can decide to tell them, give them a fuel allowance. And remember what you said about uh, it's your obligation to be honest. So, you know, just claim what you've actually uh, used for your business. Yes, at the back. Yeah, um, and that's the thing for the independent contractors or contractors. Sorry, does it? Does it apply to independent contractors or consultants? Um, it depends on how you're operating. If you're just an individual, 
and you're just an independent contractor, you know, an individual, and you give out your personal PIN, the person who is paying you is going to deduct uh, some tax that we call withholding tax. We are going to actually look at that. But if you are a company and you are a contractor and they deduct withholding tax, you still need to come and actually do this. And actually, even as an individual, remember you still need to do uh, your return, okay? Remember you still need to do your return. So, uh, but of course now, uh, you, will, you, you can, you will, even for businesses, even for sole proprietorship, you will actually use the same model to determine um, the taxable income. But of course now if you're an individual, you're going to use, uh, you're going to subject it to uh, the, what we call the graduated, uh, the graduated scale as opposed to 30%. Okay? But, but you still use the same Yeah. You still need to determine what is uh, allowable and what is not allowable. Okay? So once you, are, you arrive at your adjusted profit, then uh, you subject that to 30%. If it's a loss, you carry it forward and uh, you claim it against... Um, uh, your adjusted profits, if you will if you be in a profitable position, then you claim it against that the next year. And you can carry forward losses up to 10 years now. The losses. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. For yeah. Yes, it, it, it's important, and, and that's why, that's what we are trying to insist, that just start complying from the start, because either way, then you're losing your money. Because if uh, you are using uh, a lot of expenses, then of course, even your accounting, you won't even have an accounting profit. It will actually be an accounting loss, okay? So when you do this, either way, uh, likely you will end up in a, in a loss position, which you need to carry forward to the next years. Okay? Yeah, so these are some of the obligations. Um, for corporation tax, this is for companies. Uh, what you need to do is that, uh, let's say this is your first year of operation and you've determined your tax. Uh, I'll use a December year end as an example. But uh, yeah, I'll use an, a December year end as an example. So you've determined uh, your taxes for the year. When do you need to pay them? For a December year end, you need to pay it by the end of April. Okay? For any, of course, businesses can have various year ends, so it's by the end of the fourth month of your year end. So if your company's year end is June, uh, then you need to pay that by September, by the end of September, okay? By the end of the fourth month. So you've done your first year, you've paid that, then the next year you need to determine uh, um, what we call installment taxes, because actually, um, Corporation tax is paid on the basis of installment taxes, which is actually uh, an advanced tax that is paid to the government. And this is how you do it. Uh, of course, you won't pay it in your first year, but for the next year, you need to determine what tax you need to pay, and you need to pay that on installment. So if you're a December year end, by the time you're getting to April, 20th April, that's when the first installment tax um, is due. So these computations will mostly be done between uh, January up to March, if you're a December year end, okay? And what you do is that, um, the previous slide, once you decide, once you've um, gotten what, um, once you've gotten what your tax here is, and now you need to determine uh, your installment tax for the next year. What you do is that there are two bases of determining uh, installment tax. The first basis is what we call the prior year basis, which is you take the prior year's taxes, and assume that there will be a 10% growth on that, okay? So you assume that there will be a 10% growth uh, on the profit that you're going to make uh, the next year, so your tax will actually uh, uh, rise by 10%. And then that, 10, uh, whatever you get, one 10% of prior year's uh, tax, then you divide it by four. So you pay it in four equal installments. That's the first method and that is what is advisable. The second method is, uh, if you think your business is not going to do good, then you can use your budgeted financial statements, okay? For that year, if you have your budget, you know this will be the income, 
this will be the taxable, then you can do your own calculations and say, okay, my taxes will actually be less than the last year. If that's what your determination is, then you just take that tax that you've determined for the current year, and then you divide it by four, and uh, pay it in four monthly equal installments. But the problem is that if you use uh, the current year basis, and you end up in higher taxes than last year, then uh, it becomes punitive, you'll be punished for that. But if you use um, the prior year, even if you end up paying uh, less taxes, then uh, there is a leeway for that. Okay, so the installment taxes are paid on the 4th, 6th, yes. Um, just repeat that statement. So if you use your budget set, if you use your, um, you know, you think that you're going to make X amount of profits, yeah. and then it happens to be less, you're going to be banned for that. Yes. It's a budget. It's a budget, and that's why it's advisable that you use last year's. You have to be sure that this year's taxes will actually be less than last year's taxes. If they end up being more, then you'll actually have underpaid your installment taxes. Okay? So it's advisable to use uh, last year's uh, taxes unless you're sure. You know, as a businessman, you'll know, uh, for example, uh, this year was an election year, because when you're doing that last year, then you'll know that next year will be tough, depending on, on what your business is, okay? So if, if you do that, you're actually taking a risk. If you, if you use the current year, you're taking a risk. Because it, if it ends up being more than the last year, then you'll have underpaid your installment taxes. That's just the law. Two questions. Yes. If you, if you use last year as the 10% and you end up overpaying, do they refund? And then two, if, for example, in a quarter you have some, uh, because of some reasons, election, whatever, you have bad cash flow, uh, and you're not able to pay those uh, problems, do they allow something like that? <laughs> Um, okay, there is no negotiation, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, payment plan. But what happens is that if you think that you are going to struggle for that, then that definitely means that uh, your profit that you had budgeted, you will probably not meet that profit. Okay, so at any given time, of course, these payments are made uh, by the fourth, sixth, ninth, and the twelfth month. So if it's a December year end, uh, they are payable by April, June, September and uh, December. So if you've already paid the first and the second installment, uh, fourth and sixth, or uh, rather uh, April and June, and then by the time you're going to the third installment, uh, you note that uh, business is not doing well. You actually, uh, you actually encourage to now recalculate, you know, just do the budget based on what your projections are until the end of the year. Of course, you'll have uh, an actual of six months, and then you have a budget of, of the rest of the six months, and then use that to calculate and see what will my tax be this year? If sometimes, if business is as bad, you'll find that uh, the installment that you've already paid has actually covered the tax that will be payable. At that moment, you can actually do that calculation and decide that you're not going to pay the ninth and the twelfth installments if it's already covered. Remind me of your first, your first question, sorry. Yeah, so if you say that you end up overpaying. Ah, all right. If you end up overpaying, um, it's not... It can be refunded, but you just carry it forward to, uh, to the next year. If you ask for a refund, they'll definitely come for an audit. <laughs> and trust me, you'll end up with nothing. So just carry it forward. Also, you can touch it from the next year. Yes. <laughs> Actually, what you do is that next year when you're doing the installment taxes, you have an overpayment that you've carried forward, okay? So if you determine your first installment, you can actually now deduct that and see if there's any credit that you still be, you'll still be able to carry forward or if there's something small that you still need to pay. Yeah. Unless you're closing down, don't ask for the refund. Okay. For the uh, equal instrument payment, is it a requirement you have to pay after every four months? Because I know some company they do it after six months. Um, You need to make, actually these are exact dates under the law, that by the fourth month of the end of your year, you need to make an installment tax payment. So if you decide to 
wait until uh, the six month and not pay anything, then it means that, yeah, sorry? No, you don't need to file a return for this. These are just payments. But if someone comes in and say, okay, this was your tax, this is what you're supposed to pay, but I only see two installments, what happened? Of course, they can, unless now you've, uh, you've decided to use uh, the, uh, the, the current year and then you, you've noted that actually your tax will be less. Now you can, you can be allowed to, to, play, to play around with that. But if your tax is still more than last year's, there's definitely a penalty. So if, if your tax is more than last year, um, you know, you're in trouble. And then, as in, I'm sure there's like a percentage, you know, is it like 10%? It's 10%, correct. There's a 10% um, uh, buffer, so to speak. So if, if you use uh, current year, and then uh, it ends up that the year's taxes are more than last year's taxes, if it's more than 10%, then that's when the penalty kicks in. So they give you a buffer of 10%. All right, uh, so of course we've talked about the balance of tax and the installment taxes, and uh, of course you need to file your return by the sixth month of your year end. So for December year end, 6th of June. Okay. So next we are going to talk about, yes please. Your financial year, your company's financial year. So this only applies to LLC, right? Not to sole proprietors. Um, this is LLC, but you see for sole proprietorship, your tax year is January to December. But the next slide, we are going to see if you're a sole proprietor and uh, you don't meet certain thresholds then we are going to see how you can actually uh, make it simple uh, in terms of uh, your tax payments, okay? So this is for LLCs, of course, for a sole proprietor. Uh, by the time you're hitting those thresholds, there's no need of you operating as a sole proprietor. But we are going to see in the next tax uh, what is probably suitable for our sole proprietorships. So the next tax is uh, turnover tax, and uh, in the interest of time, uh, kindly allow me just to uh, I'll probably be a, a bit more quicker. But uh, so turnover tax, uh, turnover tax is uh, uh, I would call it sort of like an alternative to what we've just looked at, corporation tax. It's it's tax on your income, and it's uh, for uh, mostly for uh, for sole proprietorship. Let's just look at the uh, at the threshold, or rather the requirements for, uh, for turnover tax. So if you're earning, if you're, if you're a sole proprietorship and you're earning income, and that income is not rental income, it's not uh, a management of professional fee, so you're not a consultant, it's not a training fee, it's not income from incorporated companies, which you've seen, it's not an LLC, and uh, it's not income which is subject to uh, final withholding tax, for example, dividend. So if you're just doing business and uh, you meet all this, you know, your income does not come from all this, then you actually qualify for turnover tax. But there are other qualifications that you need to meet as well. Um, in terms of your turnover, it has to be between 500,000 and 5 million uh, annual. That's, a, that's an annual threshold. So if you're making are more than 500,000, but you're still below uh, 5 million. We are going to see later that 5 million actually, as, uh, uh, 5 million and above, you're now required to, for example, register for VAT and stuff like that. So if you're within this threshold and your incomes are, um, as we have seen, are not from the sources that uh, we have seen in the previous slide, then you, are, you can actually uh, account for your taxes using turnover tax. Okay? And turnover tax is. 3% of the gross receipts of the business. So there's no 
allowable, there's no disallowable, you just take your gross receipts, subject it to 3%, and you remit that to the KRA. So it's much, much, much simpler, and it's advisable for sole proprietorships who are within that threshold and uh, the incomes that we've seen. Okay? So for turnover tax, uh, you account for it quarterly. You need to file a quarterly return, and you pay for it quarterly. So at the end of each quarter, and for this, it's, um, of course, it's a calendar year, so we are looking at January to December. So after the first three months, then by the 20th of the next month, you need to uh, file a return, and 3% of whatever you'll have made, uh, then you, uh, you account for that. But of course, uh, if you're starting up and then you need to uh, you, you, you know that your expenses are more, then you can abandon the turnover tax and actually just do your tax computation. But if you know you're going to end up in a profitable position, then this actually makes it easier. But if you know you are incurring more expenses and there are business expenses, genuine business expenses, that are going to leave you in a lost position, then you're better off just doing the tax computation. Okay? No, it has to be, sorry, below? Or oh, 500, no. It has to be between 500 and 500 for you to qualify for turnover. No one is gonna chase you for that. No, if it's an LLC, uh, you definitely have to have to account for it. You see, this is for if it's an LLC. Okay, um, um, uh, probably next time you are going to see some of the things that uh, trigger audits. You see, if if it's an LLC, of course you're already filing your returns, your company returns, and uh, but it also depends. Uh, for the small companies, rarely do a KRA get to them, but uh, the important thing is that you just start complying because. I would think that um, if you're in business, you're in business to grow big, okay? So you just start complying uh, early enough. By the time you're getting there, then you're already compliant. It's already in your system, okay? So no one will chase you, but doesn't mean that it's, that it's right. Yeah. Okay. So next we're going to look at uh, withholding tax. And uh, withholding tax essentially is a tax that is paid on, on services, but we are going to see other payments that are also uh, liable to withholding tax. And I think this is very important, especially for, um, okay, the gentleman that had asked the question, I see that he stepped out. But someone at the back also asked something about uh, contractors and how uh, you are supposed to account for that. The, there's this, uh, especially for NGOs and you know, not-for-profit organizations, what you find is that just because you have an exemption certificate, then you find that these people are actually not accounting for any taxes, okay? And that's a problem because withholding tax, essentially, just know that it's not your tax. If you're exempt, that exemption is on the income that you're earning, the, the income that you're getting. Withholding tax is income of another person. So this is just an obligation that the government has put on you uh, that you actually need to withhold that tax. It's, uh, for example, it's the same, um, uh, it, it's just like a pay as you want. Pay as you want is not the employer's income, it's actually the employee's income. But the law uh, requires that the employer must, must withhold before they pay them, uh, before they pay the employee. So that's withholding tax. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's mostly on services, on payments that are made um, to residents and non-residents. So you'll find that uh, there are different rates for resident and non-residents, which we are going to look at. And uh, there's what we call the tax point for withholding tax. This has been an ongoing debate for quite a while, whether uh, you account for it on payment or whether you account for it uh, when you accrue for it um, in your account. So luckily, um, there has been a a ruling, uh, a tax appeals tribunal ruling that came in uh, recently that actually confirmed that withholding tax should be accounted for on payment. So when you're paying, that's when 
you deduct whatever is deductible, and then you withhold. Are we together so far? Uh, so why withholding tax? Some people wonder, uh, why do I need to withhold? I can just pay that person their income and they can go uh, account for their, own, for their own taxes. But there are, various, there are various reasons why withholding tax is charged. The first is because uh, it's actually uh, in the law. And um, in terms of cash flows uh, for the KRA, it's, a, it's an advanced tax. Because remember, at the end of the day, you still need to account for, if you're an LLC, you still need to account for your corporation tax. But it's an advanced tax for the KRA. So in terms of cash flow, they get your money upfront. And even for the taxpayer, if I'm a consultant and I've provided a service for you, and you pay me, you withhold, uh, let's say, 5%. Then, in terms of my cash flows, I know that uh, at least when it comes to the end of the year when I'm determining my taxes, uh, at least I know 5% has already uh, been paid. So it also manages uh, my cash flow because, of course, you know when you receive money, uh, it becomes a bit difficult to, uh, to get it out. So it's also um, an effective collection measure, of course, through the use of taxpayers. And this is what I was saying. Withholding tax is not your tax. But if you don't, if you fail to withhold, if you're making a payment that you're supposed to withhold and you fail to withhold, the government won't go for the person who received that payment. They'll actually come for you. So if you don't withhold, it becomes your tax. Okay? Excuse me, just to understand the withholding tax better. Yeah. Please give a live example of that. Yeah, yes, you can. Thank you. Okay, so if you don't withhold, it becomes your tax. And this is what uh, I was saying. I mean, the best form of tax planning is tax management. So once you know the taxes that you're supposed to account for, some things like this should not be occurring. If it's a withholding tax, it's a withholding tax you withhold, and uh, you know, you remit the money. If you don't, it becomes your tax. So it's also an avenue uh, for taxing non-residents. For foreigners who have probably come to provide services in Kenya. Of course, they are, not, um, they are not registered for taxes in Kenya, so how do they pay those taxes in Kenya? You just, uh, if they are providing services and you're paying them, the government requires you to withhold, and that way, they pay for that income that, is, uh, that they've made in Kenya. So these are some of the payments that are subject to uh, withholding tax. Uh, interest, dividends, agency fees, royalties, management, professional, training, consultancy fees, uh, all those kind of fees. I don't know if that's what you meant by a live example or... No, that is not uh, under here. Remember, if, 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 if you have shares, uh, you're the one who has invested. So you're the one who will receive the payment, okay? So it's the person who is making the payment who is supposed to account for this. So they will call. They will call. Yes. Then when I, if they have withheld, when I am making my tax, does it reflect the timing? For dividends, no. But if you're a consultant and uh, someone withholds, uh, they're supposed to issue you with a withholding tax certificate. We're going to see that. And when now you are doing your calculations, the tax computation that we did, you remember at the bottom we had, um, at the bottom we had the tax payable, okay? If you have the withholding tax certificate, then you deduct that from what is, uh, from the tax payable. And then you, you remain with a balance. So there are also contractual fees, building, civil, and engineering. Uh, this one have uh, a different rate. So these are some of the withholding tax uh, obligations. Like we've said, the responsibility is on the person making the payment. And if you don't withhold, remember, it becomes your tax. Of course, you compute the tax um, at the relevant rate. We are going to see those rates and remit the tax 
uh, by the 20th day of the following month. So if you're making a, a payment today in, in, in August, then by the 20th of the next month, you need to accumulate all the withholding tax that you've deducted and then uh, remit that to the Revenue Authority. Yeah. I know most organizations that, let's say you're a consultant, they they avoid paying, they have avoid withholding new tax and ask you to actually remit your own taxes. That's not correct. But it's not your problem. <laughs> no, it's not. I, I, or you are the one who is not withholding. <laughs> If you are, then it's a problem for you. And would it be a problem if you're like a sole proprietor, or you know, what kind of organization would you have to be for it to be? Any as, as long as you're making those payments that uh, we've highlighted. So um, another question, like let's say you're an agency correct collecting rental income for different individuals, so you do not own the property, yeah. yeah. And you know you're making these payments. You're always collecting, but you're making these payments. So, as in, how would you go about it? You know, <laughs> or you're an agency. Um, you're handling a certain, like you know, certain kind of workers, and you're paying them, but it's not you paying them. You're paying them on behalf of a client. How would you go about that? Would you also have to withhold? Yeah, so uh, when answering that, I'll take you back to the point where he said, when you're looking at withholding, it's on payment. So in the example that you've given, you, you're the agent. You're the one who actually goes collecting the rent, yeah? So and after you collect the rent, you normally take your amount, and then you give to the property owner his due, yeah? So the question that I will ask myself, the person, the property owner, he didn't even have the chance to withhold the amount because you, you've already taken your cut, your agency fee, before you gave him the entire amount. Because you see, in a normal situation, it would be you collect the full rent, give it to the property owner, and then the property owner gives you your cut. So in the example that you've given, is it that the property owner receives the net amount or you give him the whole amount, then he gives you your agency fee? he receives the net amount. So you see, in such a situation, he's not had the opportunity to withhold. But in such a situation, what he was saying, Todi was saying, is that the obligation to withhold now would be on the property owner because he's the one who's contracted you as the agent. So in such a situation, if the property owner knows this is his obligation, he would normally tell you, when you're remitting to me, you give me including the withholding amount so that now he can have the chance to go and pay to the revenue authority. Because if he does not withhold, that would mean he's the one to actually bear your tax obligation. Yeah? Thank you, Lydia. Satisfied? OK. Um, yeah, so these are the other obligations. Of course, uh, once they withhold, they need to issue with a withholding tax certificate. And nowadays, that is, um, is generated through iTax, so it becomes easy. Once that other person withholds, uh, if you go to the iTax page, you should see it. I have a question. Sometimes yeah. when you raise an invoice to the client, you raise the VAT, and when making the payment, they say that they have withholding tax. So they do both VAT and... There is, there is a withholding VAT if you are a, if you are a um, appointed agent, appointed withholding VAT agent, but that's different from this. Withholding tax. Okay. Uh -huh. so we, are provided, we, are, we provide a service. Yeah. So we already did the VAT yes. on the seat. Yeah. So when we are doing the service, they say now we need to we deduct Yes. Is it allowed? Yes, that's good. That's exactly what we are saying. But then they need to give you the withholding tax certificate so that when you're accounting for your tax, you take that 5% as a credit. Okay? Yes, at the back. Um, I want to give you my example so that I understand my responsibility. 
Yes, if you are making any payments regarding to withholding tax. For your employees, it will be pay as you want. Pay as you want. Yes. Then I go above the 5 million where the supply. You see, this, this is on payment. Whether you, whether you are within that threshold or not, that threshold was only for turnover tax. Okay? So this is on... If you're making um, a professional uh, fee payment, if you're making a management fee payment, if you're paying a consultant, it doesn't matter, you know, what amount you're making. You're supposed to withhold. Yeah. All right, so these are some of the rates. So if you pay someone 5,000, you withhold 5% of that. Actually, there's a threshold, 24,000 per month. Okay? Yeah, so it, there's a threshold, 24,000. Sometimes you can tax plan along this and pay someone in bits of 24,000 every month. But uh, yeah, the threshold is actually at 24,000. Okay? So 5% is what will uh, probably uh, apply most of the times if you're dealing with professionals, consultants. Uh, and then, of course, building civil and engineering works. But it's, uh, remember, this is not just uh, normal repairs. It has to be, you know, uh, a civil engineer. It has to be an engineer. So, for example, constructions and stuff like that, uh, the withholding tax is usually at 3% on contractual fees. Royalties, 5%. These are the rates for residents. Interests. 15%. And of course, if you're, if, you're paying, if you're repaying a loan and you're paying interest to the bank, that one you don't withhold. But if the bank is paying you interest, they are going to withhold. Uh, dividends, 5%. And this includes uh, East African community citizens who are considered uh, residents for purposes of this uh, particular tax. For purposes of dividends, actually, not withholding tax. So these are the payments to non-residents. Uh, management of professional fees, 20%. Royalties, 20%. Of course, you can see that the rates are higher. Dividends, 10%. Interest is actually the same. But for the countries that Kenya has uh, what we call a double taxation agreement, you usually find a reduced rates of this. For example, if you're paying a consultant from the UK, instead of withholding 20%, you should withhold 12.5%. Uh, if it is India, then that's 17.5%. So you also need to know if you're dealing with foreigners, then uh, where are they coming from? Yes, please. Uh, the previous, the first slide. Yeah, there. Uh, what's the difference between consultancy fees and the second is the contractual, for example, uh, engineer as the profession, not as a Sorry, engineer? Engineer. Uh -huh. engineer. Does it fall under that? Uh, it, it, it depends. If they are giving you consultancy fees, even if they are an engineer, then it falls under consultancy fees. But if it's a contractual fee, uh, there is actually uh, an actual project, you know, a building civil and engineering works. You have to read it together, okay? Building civil and engineering works. So if they are just consulting, then it's consultancy. But if, uh, it's, if, if, if what they're doing is uh, the contractual work, for example, those guys who are contracting there, the, the guy who, has, who is doing that, that should be 3% on the contractual fee. Okay, uh, so that's my session. I'm going to invite uh, my colleague Lydia uh, to take you through the next session. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please. Sorry. A quick question on one of your very initial slides. Yeah. Uh, talking about the business practice. So how uh, easy or hard is it to go from one to the other? Uh, so I'm thinking of uh, a partnership. And you talk about the uh, partnership is very difficult. So if I uh, from a partnership to an LLP is not uh, is not difficult. Although 
the issue about conversion is that uh, you know it's not like just uh, you need to file one document. You know, it's it's not as easy as that. At the end of the day, um, you're just going to sort of like go through the the same application, but it's just that now you're saying that we're already an existing partnership, so we already have these terms. It's just that now we want it to be uh, to be limited. So whatever documents that you need uh, to file for it to be limited, that's what you'll need to do. You'll, you're still going to use the same name. You're still going to remain the same structures. As in, if you have any other, if you had entered into any other contracts, any contracts before, they're still going to remain. It's just that you're changing your form, and most likely you're going to still be using the uh, the same name. Yeah, but it's not difficult. Uh, from a sole proprietor, what you do, I, I mean, uh, as a sole proprietor, you've already registered uh, probably a business name that uh, you're operating with. So what happens is that at least that business name will not have been taken because it's already, it's already reserved for you. So it's just filing uh, the constitutive documents, the memorandum and articles uh, for you now to, uh, to, to turn into an LLC and you give back uh, your business certificate uh, registration. Business name registration certificate. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it's uh, now it's online. It's easy. It's also easy to do that you don't even explain the momentum and actually they already have a standard one. Yes. For articles, there is one that is in the uh, Companies Act that you can adopt. You just indicate that you adopt the, comp uh, the articles as per um, the Companies Act. For the memorandum, actually, now it's, uh, there is a form that actually now once you fill, fill the details of the shareholders and the shares, that actually now becomes the memorandum. Yeah, so it's not, uh, those, those of you who've set up companies before, you know how those documents used to look like. Very complicated, eh? with a lot of information. Yeah, it's, it's much simpler now. Last question before I sit. Yeah. Sorry? For a limited company. Yes, there's no pressure. Yeah, yeah. There's a threshold. Yeah. The corporate tax is correct. The tax is correct. Correct, correct. That's what we said. If you're a company, you can't do. So that applies only, I'm not sure whether it applies to partnerships, but um, we likely apply to uh, sole proprietorship. If you're a company, you need to file corporate tax return. Okay, there is a Q and A question uh, session after this as well, but let's go ahead before you forget. Um, instead of just saying it's a uh, yeah. but there's also all the staff, the religious organizations, trusts, holding companies, CBOs. Is there any that is better to bring the like, um, a trust? Um, you see, limited liability companies uh, is usually for profit-making organizations. So for non-profit-making organizations, you'll have those options. You'll have the option of a trust. You'll have the option of a, a, you know, an NGO or a company limited by guarantee. But if you're into profit-making, then you need to set up a, a limited liability company. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, not pro <laughs> I'm not sure how to, to explain that. A not-for-profit is... Uh, what, 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 what example do you have in mind? Um, uh, a school. Yes, a school, but I, I don't understand about a school that doesn't make profit. You see, you can make profit, but um, how do I explain this? You see, even NGOs, they do make money, okay? But the money that they make is for their core business, okay, which is um, um, reinvesting into the business, which basically is uh, relief and uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, if you look at the Income Tax Act, those are some of the requirements that you need to prove uh, to the authority before they actually give you an exemption uh, certificate. 
And of course, you have, of course, you're making money. Even if you have the exemption certificate, you still have to prove that you are replying that money into that. If, for example, if, you're, if it's a school and uh, at the end of the year, uh, you are, you, you're paying yourself some bonuses, not some bonuses. You can pay yourself bonuses as employees. But at the end of the year, you're paying yourself sort of like a, a distribution, maybe a dividend. Then you're definitely not, uh, you're definitely a profit-making entity. If you're just paying your salaries, then uh, that's expected. And uh, whatever, whatever remains then is reinvested into the school. That's fine. And you can actually get, uh, uh, you can actually get an exemption certificate for that. I think, uh, I think uh, to follow up on that question, I think uh, many of the companies in Kenya, uh, I think Nairobi Hospital, USIU, all these, uh, they are registered uh, as not for profit. So, I mean, and it looks like very lucrative. So, what's stopping me? <laughs> because, uh, it is, but you see, at the end of the day, I'm, if I'm a taxman, I'm going to come and ask you, as in, okay, so this is what uh, uh, you had at the end of the year. How was it spent? Okay? If you're reinvesting, if you're building more uh, uh, structures, of course, that's reinvesting into, into that business. But then if I see somewhere that there's a, that there's a distribution, then that becomes a problem. That becomes a, a profit-making entity now. Yes, coming on the issue of resident and non-resident, is it just, um, is it about your paperwork or is it your location? It's your location. Okay, so if you're, if you're a Briton and you're in Kenya, yeah. you pay... Uh, you will need to be in Kenya for 183 days for you to become tax resident in Kenya. Okay, yeah. so that's why you need. So if the person is elsewhere, that's why you're applying the 20%? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. if they're not resident in Kenya. I see. Last two questions, please, so that we continue. Time is not on our side. Just a yes. follow-up on this question about non for profit and for profit. Yeah. The question that most likely most of the answer that I will hear from you is about like does the tax man look into the like the ethical and morality of your spending expenditure. Like, we had this organization that the bishop of bling for all of this stuff, like does the tax look into that? Has provided that like as long as I justify that this golden chain is needed to advance whatever. You see, you see, you see what happens is even even for a church and all these organizations, uh, the bishops and and, and uh, you know all the church stuff, they're actually employees of the church, all right. And in as much as the church itself is not taxable, they still need to be accounting for pay as you want. okay. And nowadays, KRA are actually uh, carrying out what we are calling uh, lifestyle audits. You've gone there and, um, you know, you're this flashy lawyer or, you know, you are, uh, you know, you're just this flashy guy and no one knows where your money is coming from, okay? And then they go into your records, there's nothing that's being reported. That's called a lifestyle audit that, and you can be sure that uh, you're going to be getting a letter from the KRA. So even for the bishops, if, for example, whatever they're doing and then it's seen that, um, uh, you know, that the salary that they're receiving is not commensurate with the lifestyle that they're, that they're living, they have a right to come and ask questions and, you know, well, how is this money being plowed back into the church? Okay? Uh, so, already the for the Um, uh, what I would advise is that it depends. You know, you can do your projections and see. Right now, maybe I'm just starting out, and uh, I'm probably, uh, I'll, I'll probably not make any profits, okay? If you're not going to make any profits, I'll advise you, not even turning into an LLC, you can just do your computations as a sole proprietorship, and actually arrive, uh, the computation that we had done, and actually uh, uh, arrive at a loss, okay? But if, if, uh, if you know that uh, what you're doing is profitable, and you don't want to undergo the stress of, um, you know, uh, record keeping, 
<laughs> the, instead of uh, every time you incur an expense, you need to, because remember, if you have expenses, you need to have support for that, okay? No, it's not an abstract figure that you just uh, pick from the air. So you, you definitely need to have record for that. If you don't want to do that record keeping, then uh, it's easier just to do the turnover tax. And that's my time, guys. Thanks. Going to look at uh, pairs one, and here it's a uh Payers UN is considered more of a personal issue because uh, if you're employed, it's going to really touch on you. And if you're an employer, you're trying to look at it, how will I minimize also my cost? So, but how we are going to look at it, we're going to look at it from the perspective of a company. What is your obligation? Uh, and what do you have to do about payers UN? And even if you're employed somewhere, you need to understand when you receive that pay slip and you see they've taken a huge chunk of your money, yeah, it's good to understand how did they arrive at that. So when you're looking at the income that is subject to pay as you want. There are two ways in which your employer can actually pay you, where they can give you actual cash, they give you a good salary, and then, or they give you some additional amounts in your pay slip. Or there are other things that they can give you, such as uh, what you are calling non-cash benefit. And here, non-cash benefits, this is where maybe they're extending to you a house, they're giving to you a car. So those are the other benefits that you need to look at. And sometimes uh, some organizations are so good that they even pay for you membership in a gym, a club membership. Those are the things that we are going to look at. And when you're looking at the cash benefits, this is where we are looking at the amount of cash that goes out. It's cash money, and, it's, and something can easily be converted to cash money. So that's why we are having the salary and wages. And then there is per diems. For per diems, this is where somebody has gone out of workstation. If somebody is not working, let's say, in the normal living home, coming to the office in the CBD, you sell them uh, tomorrow, you're going to Nakuru for a project. At that time when they're leaving, going out of station, you have to give them some additional amounts to cater for the expenses when they go outside. And that's where we have per DMs. And for per DMs, how it's looked at is the first 2,000. If I give you 2,000 and that's it, it's okay. I won't even have to tax you. But if the amount goes above 2,000 and the person does not account for it, it's considered additional employment income and is subject to tax. So most of organization, they normally stick to 2,000. And if it is above 2,000, as I said, ensure the employee accounts for it. Accounting for it may mean that uh, you give them 5,000 for the day and you know the per diem is 2,000. If they spend more than the 2,000, the 3,000 has to be accounted for. So they have to bring receipts where they bring maybe taxi, the lunch receipts they had, and if they paid uh, some form of accommodation or other expenses, then they need to account for it. And then uh, net agreed emoluments or any grossing up. In certain organization, we found that an expatriate is coming in. And this expatriate has done very good negotiations where they're saying, me, I want my one million and one million net. Don't tell me about taxes in Kenya. If there's withholding, if there's payers you want, that's your obligation. In such a situation, you as the employer, if, you've ne if this person has negotiated a net amount, and it means that you're going to pay them one million, if it is the one million you're going to pay them, it's assumed that payers you want has already been deducted. That means that if we look at it, tax is 30%, that means you've given them 70%, and there's the 30% which you have to bear as an obligation. If you're going to bear that tax on behalf of that employee, it means you're actually extending them a benefit. Because in a normal situation, it would have been the 1 million, then you deduct 30%, then they go home with 700, right? But this time, they're going home with 1 million. That means you as the employer, you're taking up that obligation of pay as you want. And it's considered an additional benefit which you as the employer, you have to pay taxes on it. 
And then there's compensation on termination. When somebody is being terminated and you discuss some exgratia payment or additional payment, all those final dues also have to be subjected to tax. Yeah, any questions on the cash, cash benefits that are there? Yes. Uh, this yeah. Yeah, yeah, so what happens? Is it part of the employee or is it treated as tax on It's treated it's for that that if it's below two thousand, it's not taxed on you. In fact, what would happen is you will go for if you're given just the two thousand, it's considered per diem for the day and it wouldn't be taxed on you. But if it is above two thousand and you don't account, then in fact the entire amount now is taxed on you, not just the three thousand the entire 5,000. Yes, so in the pay slip it will even come there as additional uh, income. Yes, at the back. Two thousand per person per day. So there are other non-cash benefits. So for the non-cash benefits, there is usually a cap at what point do we start taxing them. If you give the non-cash benefits anything below 36,000, it's not subject to tax. Anything that goes above 36,000, then that is subject to tax. Other non-cash benefits we look at is furniture. You can come and you say uh, you're being given furniture for the company, but this one you'll mostly see it in manufacturing entities where they're outside uh, Nairobi, in the remote areas, because somebody has come and uh, they don't have a place or anything, so you give them furniture. So what you're supposed to do as for taxation is look at the value of the furniture and do 1% of it per month. But what you'll find mostly is that some furnitures have been in the organization for the last 20 years. In terms of value, even there's no value. So these are one of those issues that the revenue authority really doesn't look at so much because if the furniture has been in the organization for the last 50 years, fully depreciated, even if you look at them, they look miserable. Eh? So these ones, you just let it slide. And then there's telephone and internet. And uh, this one has been interesting because it's the whole phenomenon of telephone and internet came the other day. In the past, it wasn't there. And what you'll even find, it's not even in the main legislation. It's more of a guideline that was given afterwards. Because what is happening is we cannot operate. We cannot operate without our mobile phones. We cannot operate without internet going forward. Even at home, you still need the internet. So how it's usually taxed is you take, uh, if it is the prepaid lines, you take the bill that you have, do 30% of that bill. That is what is considered the benefit. And after you've done 30% of it, the tax is on the 30% of the 30%. So in the end, it becomes a very small amount because from the entire bill, it's due 30% 30, 30 and again 30%. So it's usually a very small amount. And then the other benefit which I discussed is when the company actually pays for you club subscriptions. And then there's uh, the one for meals, where you want to be the best employer in the world and you decide, yeah, I need to give them meals and I'll even start from breakfast, come lunch, even evening, I'll, add, I'll throw in another meal, eh? maybe take away home. So what happens is that for meals, if there's a, anything that will be above 4,000 per, per month, it will be taxable. But if it is below that, if the value of the meal uh, becomes low, it's not taxable. And this one you can do a rough estimate. Yeah? If 4,000 uh, divide by 20. We normally work for 20 days, yeah, in a month. So 4,000 divided by 20, it comes to 200, yeah. So this is some, those are, these are some of the tax management skills you can take in in terms of, you can throw in the meals for the employee, but ensure it is below 4,000. And then there's the housing benefits. Uh, and what we take is the higher of 15% of em employment income or rent paid. Here, this is where you look at what is the value of the rent. If the rent is 200,000, you compare it with what is 15% of 1 million. It comes to 
150. So meaning the benefit that we will take is the actual rent paid. The taxman usually takes the higher amount. Eh? That's what will be subject to tax. And then there's the last one. If you're being given a car, here you have to compute the car benefit. That one, it is, uh, it is a taxable benefit on you, and you have to pay taxes on it. Any questions on the, car, on the, on the taxable and cash benefits? Yes. So you're looking at it from a business perspective. You as a company, whether they are allowable, yes, they are. You, you can claim all of them as expenses. But here, the main thing you have to ensure on your employees, they have paid taxes on them. Yeah. Yes. Farming, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you making profit? <laughs> you see, as we had said uh, earlier, when when Trudy had his session, if if it, if you're making profit then there's taxes to be paid. Yeah. So even if it's a hobby and it's minting money, yes, unfortunately, you have to pay taxes. Yes, any other questions? OK. Then there are certain things that are exempt from tax, such that uh, you as the employer, you can actually give them to your employees, but claim them as normal business expenses but not incur any taxes. Some of them is medical services and medical insurance. And here is where you ensure you take a cover for all your employees and you're paying premiums. Those expenses will be allowed on you as the company and then the employees will not be taxed on the medical insurance cover that you actually given them. And the one for passage, this is when somebody is relocating. If somebody is relocating from one state and coming here and you have to uh, cater for their logistic, transport, and everything, then that is not considered a benefit, and it's a normal business expenses. And uh, we had already uh, detached a bit in terms of pension contribution. Here is where if the company is doing pension contribution to a registered scheme, and the threshold is usually uh, 240000 per annum, this one is exempt from taxes because we are looking at investing in your future. Sorry? That one will be under medical services and therefore it will not be taxed. Yes, it's exempt. Sorry? Yes. Mm -hmm. What happens with this one is there is the limit. The 240,000 will not be subject to tax, but anything above is what will be subject to tax. So it's not like the way I'd explain per diem. For this one, it's, we are looking at anything above. So if US per annum ended up being 300,000, then the 60,000 is what will now be subject to tax. This one, it will be taxed on you as the employer, employee. Yes. Because for pension, there is two ways how you have to look at it. There is where you contribute your own pension. Let's say I'm contributing 5% of my salary. And what happens is that your employer usually matches it. Yeah. So for them, they usually say, um, whatever you contribute, I match. So what usually happens when you're looking at the exemption threshold we have to look at both what your employer is contributing and what you as the individual are contributing. And they have to be the limit of 240,000. Anything above then has to be taxed. This is per person. Yes. Yes. Mine is a suggestion. I'm a bit lost. Sorry. Employer, employee. Okay, fine. Uh, thanks for that clarification. At the back. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the medical services. Yes. Yeah. They see me as an employee. Mm -hmm. The company is paying for me some medical patient, medical services. Mm -hmm. But maybe I don't like the services being done for that patient, for that patient. 
That's another one. Yes. Mm-hmm. Can I use that as an example of that? For you, if you, it's you who is doing your own, you're paying your own premiums. Yes. In fact, what would happen is that for that one, since it's personal, it's not even related to any of the business income, there's nobody to tax you on that. Because you see, if you're contributing from your own salary, it's more or less your saving. And after you've already paid pay as you want, Whatever you do with your employment income is up to you. So nobody will come and tax you or do anything after the fact. Yes. So is it a better option for me to pay my employers better for them to get their own expenses or for me to pay a medical cover? It is important for you as the employer, you pay for them, yes. Because for you, it will be a normal business expense, yes. So in terms of obligation for the employer, the employer, the first obligation is that it's up to them to compute the pay as you want that is there, and then also to ensure that the amount is paid and they file the return by ninth of the following month. And then also, the employer is supposed to furnish the employee the P9. I'm sure you saw the whole thing being advertised when people were doing their returns. Make sure you file your return, get the P9 from your employer. So it is their responsibility to actually give them the P9 to enable the employees to actually file their return. And then also it is their obligation to pay NSSF and NHIF by the due date. When you look at the obligation for the employee, one thing is they have to register so that they have the PIN. So they have to register with the KRA for their PIN, and then they also have to register for NSSIF and NHIF, and then to file their return by the due date. And for all employees, it's in June. And uh, something that it's always good to ensure, when somebody is coming to your organization and they're coming for employment, the first thing you ask them, on your checklist after they've, you've seen this is the right person, this is a qualified person, ask them for their PIN certificate, for them to give you the, a copy of the card for NSSIF and NHIF. That way you do not get the whole thing, it's time to remit, but the person has not registered. Then it becomes a penalty on you as the employer. Yeah? At the back. On the other hand, uh, um explain it further so you're looking at it at the end when the husband and the wife all have their nhif card yes like i don't have a card because i i, I go under my husband mm-hmm. yeah, and if i add one and he's working he's working on what happens is that it's obligated for each and individual Kenyan to enjoy this benefit because it's given by the government and therefore it's an obligation for even if you have a spouse who already has the card for you you have to register on your own even if you won't use it yeah Yes. Just a uh, curious, a curious soul that has been in the business. Yes. If you don't take a salary, do you have to register for all these things? If you don't take a salary, so what do you take? So. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, so right now there is no even employment income. You see, if there is no income, what would happen is that uh, if, you, if you record that there are no employees in the organization, then there is no obligation for you to ask them or pay any NSSF and NHIF. You only do this if you have employees. So for if your business is one where you're just waiting for the dividends at the end of the day, you'll just enjoy the dividends, then you won't have all this. But you could have a situation where you don't, you're not employed, but you bring in contractors. That's so if you're going to bring contractors and they are 
fewer contractors where they are the ones coming doing the job, then your obligation will be under withholding tax, whatever we had covered. So after you do withholding tax, this will not be your area. So these are the pairs you want bonds. And uh, the, the good thing is that uh, they're there on ITAX, so it's so easy for you to actually uh, compute it. And uh, what has happened is that finally the bands changed and we had new rates for 2017. And I understand the previous rate hadn't been changed for the last, I think, 20 years or so. So again, there was another change uh, which happened this year and the rates again changed. But the difference was very minimal. So we are hoping again they'll keep on changing small steps at least so that people who are earning incomes in the ranges of 100,000 and below shouldn't be taxed. You agree, yeah? yeah. <laughs> I totally agree also, yeah? Yeah. So we, any question on pay as you want before we go to VAT? Any burning questions? Yes. So uh, when you're getting a price of contractors, how do you differentiate how to pay them? How do you determine who is an employee, who is a contractor? Okay, so what happens, and uh, we had covered this in the morning, oh, it's still morning, yeah? So uh, when you're looking at a contractor, it's quite simple. For a contractor, they're the ones who determine what time they will work, how they will work, what tools they will use. So if I'm a contractor to you, I will come into that office, I'll tell you I'm coming in at 10, I will come with my laptop, I will do however I want to do it, yeah? But if I'm an employee, the first thing I will also ask is, uh, have you paid my NHIF? Have you paid my NSSF? What time do you want me to come in? What time do you want me to leave? And what are your rules in the organization so that I comply, at least I be kicked out? So those are the basic steps in terms of distinguishing who is an employee, who is a contractor. Because for an employee, you can actually control them. For a contractor, you cannot control them in terms of exactly what will happen. What, the only way you can control them is based on the contract you've given them in terms of, I need this job done by this time. However they do it, it's up to them. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Um, another question on that. Um, for their directors of the company, is it possible for them to be treated as consultants or employees and which one is applicable by law? For the directors mostly, if they're earning a salary, then you have to pay, they have to pay pay as you want. You see also, for certain directors who are not involved in their business, for them they just come for board meetings only. They are not involved in their day-to-day -day business. So for those ones, they normally get a sitting allowance. And what I've seen the practice has been, people usually now do withholding tax for that sitting allowance, because that's the only money they're earning. Yeah? Yes. Uh, based on the company structure, should there be uh, an MD? Sorry, an MD. <laughs> he's asking, he's asking in an organization, should you have an MD? So it all depends with the organization. What value will the MD bring? So we've seen certain organizations doing very well with just, and their sole proprietor is the director. And also for sole proprietor organization, they, the owner is the one who calls himself CEO stroke MD stroke owner. Yeah, stroke chairman, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so and, and you see for them, they're doing all the roles that are cutting across. So for him, he doesn't even need anybody else to give him competition, but there's nowhere in law that it says that you need an MD, nowhere. Yeah, at the back. Yes, you. Okay, I'm wondering whether you can shed some light on uh, the difference between a casual and uh, an employee as far as tax Okay, so for casual, what I've seen is that certain casual come, you don't know if they'll come tomorrow, that's number one, because they know it's the, they work only for that day, and at the end of the day, you give them either their 1,000 shilling and they go home. And what usually is in terms of looking at the type of taxes to actually pay them is if it is a casual who you know, and who you have their details in terms of, you know they will actually report to the office. Every day they will be there in the sense that that's their reporting station. 
and it's something you've told them, I need you for this entire month. You see, that is not more of a casual, that's an employee. For a casual is those ones of, whether they show up tomorrow or not, you do not know. Because today they are on this project, tomorrow they're on the other project. And that's why it's always good for you to determine depending on the project that you have. If it is a project, let's say for example, uh, what I've seen is that if you're in the farming business, yeah? and you know you have this person who does your garden every day, and you've told them how to do it, and you've given them tasks for the whole month, even if you're paying them every day at the evening. That one is more or less of your employee because you know they are there with you for a very long duration, yeah. But for a casual, is those ones of you know the obligation for them end today. Tomorrow, maybe you have work, maybe you don't have work, maybe they'll come, maybe they won't come. Yeah. So if you maybe uh, Pay them a daily rate of 1000 so you don't need to tax that. No, for that one, for casual, if you know it's only for today and tomorrow everybody pass their way, no, there's no taxes for the casual. Because going back to the bands, they're way below the bands. Yeah. Last two questions. So, for, to, to avoid a lot of uh, obligation in an employer, if I leave maybe the employee or, 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 the, or, the, or the person for the six months and I know it's going to be six months, instead of treating him like an employee and doing any tariff and all these things, can I treat him as a contractor and just involved in the three percent? It depends. If you know it's a project and the, the other ones who are coming with their own laptops, their own tools, everything, and they can even work from whatever station they want to work from as long as they are delivering the work, then it's possible for you to structure it as the six months and as contractors, provided they have a contract for that, and it's a contract between the two of you, and then they have to issue you an invoice. Now it changes because they are contractors. You see, for my, if I'm employed, I don't have to give my employer an invoice so that they can pay me my salary, no. But a contractor, they have to give you an invoice because how you have to look at it is you have to ensure there is proper documentation in terms of if you say this is a contractor, let there be supporting documentation to show that they are sub subcontractors. If it's an employee, treat them as employees. The last one and then the other one we'll handle at the end, yeah? Yes. As an employer, am I obligated to have my employees registered for NSSF in the diet of hearing? Number two, you mentioned the rate of allowance and the support rate you need before the Okay. So in terms of uh, the NSSF NHIF registration and also the PIN, you have to ensure they go and register because when you're doing, uh, when you're going to pay their salaries, it's not going, when you're doing it on ITAX, the forms won't upload or you can't be able to submit the return because there'll be somebody there who has a missing PIN. So it is, your, in, your in, it is in the interest of the employer and the interest of the employee to ensure there's a PIN for them. If they don't meet the threshold, then you're going to pay them as, as casuals. So it won't go to the normal, there no, there's no taxes to be paid on them. Because uh, we've had instances where NSSF, they have come, they have come, they have come, this person, why is he not registered? Oh, for NSSF and NHIF, if they're in your organization and as employees, you have to. Because for NSSF and NHIF, as long as they are employed, there's no limit for NSSF and NHIF. And that's why even, there's a time there was a debate that even for all the house helps we have at home, we must be paying an NHIF and NSSF for them. Yeah, it's just that the NSSF and NHIF team has not come knocking on our doors. Yeah? Yeah, okay. D directors, it's 5%. So for VAT, uh, VAT is a consumption tax. Uh, by a show of hands, how many here in their businesses have registered for the obligation of VAT? Around not more than 10, yeah? So for VAT, it's more of a consumption tax, and it's the more you consume, the more you have to pay it. And uh, in terms of where do I register for VAT, you have to look at it whether you've met the threshold. The threshold is if you're going to make sales 
of 5 million and above, then you must register for VAT. So for the people who've, who've shot their hands up, I'm sure they've reached the level of 5 million and above. The ones who are below, is it the business hasn't reached the 5 million or we didn't know or we don't want? <laughs> it's we don't want, huh? but it's, it's, it's what? <laughs> yes, VAT is a bit complicated. So it's more of if you meet the threshold of 5 million and above, please tick the obligation for VAT. And uh, what you'll see is, in, in, in essence, it depends also with the trade that you're doing. Because most of the businesses that operate are supposed to be charging VAT to whoever they are supplying to. But it's what's happening is that people do not charge the VAT because you don't raise the invoice. If you don't raise the invoice, that's when you will not even charge the VAT. But ideally, you should be raising the invoice and then you charge your VAT. Because you remember when we talked about corporation tax, if you want to claim it as a business expense, you need a what? An invoice. So that's how even all the taxes are interlinked, such that now if you want to do VAT also, and somebody wants to claim an expense, they need an invoice, and in the invoice, you've charged your VAT. So in VAT, there are two things. The people call input and output. So to keep it simple is this way. When you're talking about output, this is when we are talking about your sales, whatever is going out. That's your output, yeah? Input is the purchases that you are incurring. And this is uh, the purchases, this is the input VAT that is coming in. So in an example, let's take this example first so that to demystify everything about uh, VAT. So I'm in the business of selling chairs. Let's take it as that example. So when I'm selling seats, I sell them at 250,000. But the seeds must have come from somewhere, right? So I purchased them from somebody. And the person who purchased them from charged me a input tax. And why it's different is because I have to include my markup, yeah? So that's why there is output and input. And why it's important for you to register for VAT, because when you're doing your output and you don't register, it's fine. When KRA comes, they will ask for their output. but if you do not register for VAT and claim your input tax, that means when the revenue authority comes, for them, you see this one, the VAT due is 100. KRA will ask you for the 250 because you lost your opportunity to claim your input tax when you decided you do not want to register for VAT and file your returns. How is that? Yeah? I give it a repeat or? OK. So we've understood what is output VAT. This is sales, yeah? And if you do your sales, you have to charge your output. You have to charge VAT to the person who's buying the seats, yeah? When I bought the seats, the person who was selling me the seats gave me an invoice and also charged me VAT, yeah? So that is what makes my that's what makes my input tax there, 150. So at the end of the month, what I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to take all my output tax from all the sales I did, and then deduct all my input tax. This is all the purchases I did. And you know this one, it's all the purchases from rent, from if I bought a certain thing, I have to deduct all of it. I have to claim all of it. And then net off, do now 250 minus 150 to determine what VAT I have to pay the revenue authority. And in such an instant, the VAT I have to pay is 100K. And that's why we usually say it's important, register if you reach the threshold so that you can be able to charge and also claim. And the beauty about this is that you see, when you are doing your sales, the VAT you receive, you receive it from your customer. Is it your money? It's not your money. So why should you again become and be taxed because you did not give KRA their money? So, and then also the input VAT. You see, you are the one who's paid it. You have to claim it back. 
So that's where you do your input minus your output. So even when you register for VAT, it doesn't mean it is you who will end up suffering the tax. Because the final consumer is what who will suffer the tax. That is me who goes to buy that furniture and take it to my house. Because I won't take in that VAT anywhere. Is, now, is it now clear? So those ones who have reached the threshold, please, eh? start complying. Because when you come to be audited, what the revenue authority will demand, now they'll demand the entire 250 from you, and not even 100. Because you lost your chance of claiming the 150 when you did not register and claim the input tax. Yeah? Any questions? At the back? Um, thank you. My question is, say I am in, uh, I'm a Yes. I have gotten the job with an organization that insists I have to give an invoice. Yes. I need to have a But my turnover is not reaching 5 million. Um, does it take me? I have to let that business go because I cannot. What I've seen, you can get the extract of the law and tell them this is the requirement. And you tell them my business is below 5 million, so I have not yet reached the threshold. That's why I have not registered. If it is a reasonable person you're dealing with, they will agree. Because, and, and what you also do, do not charge them VAT. Because if you're charging them VAT, then that's why that money, it's you who is going to eat. You're not going to remit it to the revenue authority. So don't charge VAT. So your, your invoice will just read videography, one, 100,000. That's it, no VAT. Yeah. The question was where the client insists. But with your invoice, I need a digital receipt. Did you tell them yet? No, no. It's them saying, at the discussion, they're saying that uh, for me to do this job, it is our policy that we have to get the receipts for so, whatever kind of job. So, in such a situation, then, that's when now you have to make a business decision. If you find that most of your clients that you're dealing with require you to have uh, an ETR receipt, it's okay because at the end of the day, the VAT, if you're going to charge them the VAT, the 16%, it's going to come in and out. It's not your taxes, yeah? Because it's them who will bear an additional obligation because your prices will definitely go higher. Yeah? Yeah. And probably uh, just to add on to that, I think it's, uh, it's because... Um, Ideally, if someone is charging you VAT with an invoice that does not have ETR, you cannot claim that VAT, okay? So that's why probably most of the corporations insist, but they don't know why actually you need the ETR receipt. If I don't charge you VAT, I don't actually need to give you an ETR receipt. I just charge you my price, and that's it. I've not charged you VAT. But if I charge you VAT, then I need to give you an ETR receipt. So you'll find that most corporations just say, no, 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 it has to be an ETR invoice. So that's, that's the reason why. So that's why you need to make uh, a business decision whether to register for VAT. Because you can also register voluntarily, actually. Yeah. Let me have the one at the back first and then you. You, yeah, the gentleman. So does that mean I have to register just in case I'm being happy for that? I just have to register? Yes. Even, that's if, even if you don't meet the threshold, it's okay. You can voluntarily do it. Provided now that you know, once you register, it actually means you have to be filing VAT returns monthly. You must. Even if that month you do not make any sale, you still mu you must file even if it's a nil VAT return. So here, then, there. Okay, so um, my question is, uh, so VAT is, uh, even if I'm offering a part of service, VAT is optional. So long as I've not reached the uh, threshold. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That five million is it on income or is it on income? On income. 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 Why they are insisting? Because even for them, you see when it's a sale, it becomes a purchase to them. So for them, they are looking at, if you're going to invoice me, I will reduce my output tax. So that's why they are insisting on it, that if you're going to charge me VAT, charge me VAT and attach an ETR receipt so that I can be able to, uh, so that I can be able to reduce the VAT that I end up paying also. 
if if they're still insisting and they're saying that you must give them so that they do business with you, then you have to register if you really want that business. Because there's room for voluntary registration, even if you've not met the threshold. But you're right, it's actually a misconception. Yeah. If you can be able to convince them that I'm not charging you VAT and you know you won't need to claim the VAT, if you can be able to convince them, then you don't need to register. But if they insist, that's why I'm saying probably the accountant have, has been told don't yeah. accept any invoice yeah. without it here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. Just a bit. Uh, let's hear from the gentleman at the very back. No, you see what happens for the person who is actually selling, for them they are obligated to charge you VAT. Even if you, you will not go and claim it or you will not charge it to the other person, for them they are executing their obligation. And that's where they will charge you VAT. And for VAT in a perfect, for it to work perfectly, it works perfectly where the person charging you uh, is registered and even you being charged has registered so that now you can come and do your net of mathematics, yeah? But also, you also have to evaluate your business. If you find that you have so much input tax and you've not yet started, uh, you've not yet started doing sales, it's also advisable to register because this input, if it, let's say if we are to shift the math and we find that the purchases it was at 250, sale is 150. The 100 credit, you carry it forward subsequent year, yeah? Subsequent month, sorry. So that now you utilize it for future sales. And what you'll find is that if somebody is doing this really well, you'll find that you're having, uh, if at the beginning you had incurred so much purchases, purchases that means your cash is being held in the VAT account, yeah? So by the time you're making sales subsequent months, you'll find that you do not even have to remit to carry any amount of money, and you're actually trading with the VAT amount, yeah? Yeah, so it's always advisable. Register to ensure business flows smoothly. Yes? Yeah, and then now for VAT, the input tax, that is all the... Purchases. <laughs> so it also goes back first of all business don't bring if you bought your wife a nice dress you're bringing the vid you know no, no, no. in the course of business yeah <laughs> so it's for business but there's also certain things that are restricted for example for here if your business is, uh, you're the final consumer of certain things. For example, if you incur VAT on uh, passenger vehicles. Passenger vehicles, this is a saloon. A saloon vehicle. Why they say that is because sometimes you cannot measure uh, a saloon vehicle, how it's going to be used for business and for personal, especially if somebody is going with the vehicle at home. So for passenger vehicle, that one they've said the input tax you don't claim it, yeah? Yeah. So it's, the restriction is just passenger vehicles and uh, what else is the restriction? Furniture. And, and also for restaurant if it's not for business. If it is not outside the workstation. Yeah. Yes. Mm. If you're in the business of VAT exempt business, then you do not have to register. Similar things for financial institution, because for them, whatever service they give is exempt. So you do not have to register. Yes, final question, then I could proceed. When you're doing your accounts, the person who will have done the financial statements, VAT is normally removed, because VAT will be factored in here, in the in and out. Yes, so when your accounts will always be without the VAT element. However, if your business is exempt, then your accounts, 
the expenses will be inclusive of all the VAT because there is no account for to take the VAT amounts. If you are not registered, everything goes to your accounts. Yeah. Okay. So now we look at the common mistakes that uh, startups and MSMEs make. I think this one is you to tell me. Yeah, you're better placed. What do you think are some of the mistakes that you have done? And we're not judging. <laughs> yeah, stop the murmuring. Just tell me what are the mistakes you've done. So that I tell you if it's a mistake or it's a plus, yes. Every, all the taxes, all the taxes, or anything, when you're doing business in terms of taxes, what mistakes have people done? So that it's not you, what have mistakes people have done? Tell me. The cyber cafe. Okay. And you don't know. When you're asking for your compliance certificate, that's when you find disaster. I didn't know. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's what obligations to register. That is so true, yeah. You'll find that you're a startup, you don't even have an employee yet, yet you've ticked employer obligation for filing pay as you want return, you've ticked VAT obligation, you've ticked custom duty and you deal in services. <laughs> As in, you wonder, okay, when somebody looks at your certificates, they are wondering, okay, what were you thinking, yeah? But I totally agree. Yes, registering obligations that you do not, you're not supposed to be complying or you don't have. Yes, any other mistakes? Yes. <laughs> yes, it's part of it, your business. Yes, that is so true. Because even what I've seen, many investors, they have a brilliant idea, brilliant, they've thought about everything else apart from taxes. The only time they think about taxes is when they see the taxman knocking at their door. That's when they're like, oh yeah, we should have thought about taxes at the beginning also when you're thinking about this business venture. So it's always important for you to factor it in, the taxes, because why you find it that later you're complaining about it, in your business model, you didn't factor in that 30%. So you're finding it's eating into your profit, especially when you have to pay penalties and interest. Yeah? Any other mistakes? Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. The dates are pretty standard. Yeah? And you know you have to file if it is VAT by 20th. If it is pay as you want, by 9th. But then... You just forgot about it. Eh? You're thinking about the mainstream business. You're forgetting about filing the returns. So filing returns is also another common mistake that we've seen. Any other? Yes? Uh, I agree with him. To keep the cost down, especially for a startup, the first person, you, you, yourself, and you will not even think of hiring a consultant or a mason. They can maybe help you, like I've seen on the input and output VAT. To manage your costs. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, this side, there was a hand up. Yes. I, I just wanted to know if the government has considered filing uh, some kind of a business model for that because the uh, Canadian website is too complicated for some of us to understand some of the terms used here. So uh, I even find this isn't even very simple to use. Yeah, the, 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 the items, yeah? Yes, even the forms that you download, uh, I remember last time I downloaded a wrong uh, uh, form. For filing your insurance. Yeah. Okay, okay. But don't worry, maybe another time we can organize a session for just going through the ITAC model, yeah? Yeah, yeah so we'll discuss with Mekefa, yeah? And uh, the last one that we can cover. Um, the other thing about this is um, undermining the need to have bookkeeping and um, 
accounting for your expenses. They, uh, most of the startups, it's okay to issue an invoice, but it's not okay to keep track of the airtime I bought, the tea I bought a plant, um, something else that I incurred, a furniture chair I bought from my office. That's okay. See media shut up. But then it's very okay to keep the, 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 the to issue the invoices. Mm. So they they undermine the, the, the that process. Issue an invoice, keep the expenses, yeah. then have some bookkeeping, some you know, basic Yes. In fact, what I always advise my clients, if it is your own business, have a box such that any receipt you have, at the end of the day when you're emptying your pockets, the box is there where you put in all your receipts. At the end of the month, if you have an accountant, give it to them to sort. That way you ensure there is no record that you've missed out. It's always advisable. Have a box, keep all those receipts. Keep them, keep them so that now all your expenses, you can claim them. Because when the revenue authority also comes, they will ask for evidence, how did you incur this expense? Do you have a receipt for it? So it's good to keep your uh, records from the very beginning. Don't wait till you make your first billionaire. Start now, start small. So the mistakes that we've seen, you see number one, yeah? Poor record keeping, yeah? We've discussed it. The number one, the number two, the same way you guys have just said it, yeah? Ticking on the wrong obligation, yeah? And then also having a wrong business or legal structure where you think you're a church, but then you went and registered a limited company, yeah? So let's not have the wrong business structure. And then mixing business and personal expenses, yeah? Where you're thinking you have the one thing also I've seen, the bank account. You only have one bank account where it's for business, it's for personal. So everything is jumbled in in between. Have two separate accounts for business and for uh, personal. So that now all expenses are separate. So that when you're going to have a good time with your friends, swipe the right card, not the business card in the personal account. And then not deducting genuine business expenses. This is where you've done business, you've done it well, at the end of the year, there are taxes to be paid, but you know what? You didn't keep your, a, a journal of all the expenses for the business. So now you come up with a fictitious number. And you say, no, by the way, uh, my expenses were one million. And you do not have support for that. And we all know it's not genuine, yeah? And then let submissions of return. We had already covered this. Uh, and then there's this one, wrong classification of contractor vis-a-vis -vis employees. We've discussed it, and I hope you won't be that wrong classification. Yes? And there's something I want to add. There are several NGOs and organizations where all the time the contract is being released six months, one year, so they don't treat you as an employee. In the NHIS and it's a certain kind of thing. You're being treated as a contractor. Yeah. So they are paying you at a certain fee, and some even they ask for an invoice, and they will deduct to be a ticket. Is that legal? What is happening? And uh, for the people in the NGO world, when the revenue authority goes to them, they know their biggest weak point is when it comes to personal taxes, and here especially where they are treating people as contractors, it goes to that whole thing. You'll find that you have, uh, you're a contractor, but they're telling you to log in and saying you come in at 8. And you log out, you're coming out at 5. Yeah? So, and they're the ones giving you a workstation, everything. So you see, for that, for all intent and purposes, that's your employee. But you're trying to treat them as contractors. So that's why for NGOs mostly, when even they're being audited, it's usually on the personal taxes, because that's where they have uh, some weaknesses. But it's not right. If you're an employee, be treated as an employee, paid the same way, and your NSSF and NHIF are being paid for. Yeah? I have a question. Yes. Uh, so I'm trying to learn how to do the budget you have for the employees. You say you set aside like 50K. Mm -hmm. But if you go the way uh, the, the net, you see, at the end of the day, since it is the employer's obligation to, to remit pay as you want, if you do not, the obligation will lie with you as the employer, where the employer will, when the revenue authority comes to audit, they will tell you this one should have been an employee. So 
you find that you have to chip in back into your pocket to pay the additional taxes that should have been paid from the beginning. So since it is your business and you know if in the event that there's a mistake, it is me who will bear the cost, do it right from the very beginning. Um, and then also uh, another mistake is under or overestimation of taxes due. And this one we've seen it happen in VAT and also from corporation tax, if you don't keep your records, you'll find that either you have under or overestimation. And then also filing a nil return to beat the deadline. You know you're supposed to declare something, but you know you're like, ah, it's just too much work. Eh? So you just go and just file nil return. And you find that you get into a habit. A whole year has passed. For VAT, you've been doing nil. And in the actual sense, you had stuffs to declare. And then when it comes to cop tax, you just do another nil. Please note, it is fraudulent. Eh? Let's just do the right thing at the right time, yeah? So, because if you're caught even the penalty, it's double the amount of tax that should have been paid. So the penalty is 100%. So let's do it right from the very beginning. And then the other thing is, what the gentleman had said, we say that tax, it's like it's not your obligation, yeah? And you don't know even, as you're saying, because it's complicated, you don't know what to do, yeah? But as we know, ignorance of the law is, Thank you, yeah? And then also these unscrupulous professionals, yeah? Who come and tell you, I will do for you your accounts, but they don't know what they are doing, yeah? And you end up finding, saying that, no, 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 my accountant filed the return, and the accountant didn't even know how to operate the ITAX uh, model. So please, always verify. It's always good to do a background check on your professional advisor. And then also, when in doubt, it's always good to engage one who you verified, audited, ask them for professional help. And then there's a whole animal called bribing, yeah? And it's very prone in Kenya. But please, 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 when you, a revenue authority officer comes and you say, you know what, let me give them something so that this thing goes away, it only goes away when that man walks away. It doesn't mean it has gone away at, in KRA offices. It is still there, yeah? So you may think that every time you will bribe them, the issue goes away, but you're just prolonging the duration for when you should have handled an issue. So deal with the issue. If there are any taxes to be paid, pay at the very beginning so that you avoid being in this funny position. And now with the new act, the Burberry Act that came in in 2016, the, if you're found guilty, there's imprisonment involved. So, and if you go to prison, who will be left running your business, yeah? So, when you look at just briefly the recent trends, you all know about there's the gambling tax that came in, yeah? It was a hot topic where the gambling companies were supposed to pay initially 50% yeah, tax, and then it went down. So, this one, it, 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 it it brought out so many debates, but because people are saying for gambling tax, should it be there, should it not be there? But everybody has their say on this. But right now, there's a gambling tax at uh, 35%. And then there was something new that was introduced, tax amnesty. And this one is what you can even tell your relatives who are outside. Eh? And for tax amnesty, this is where you're being told, and it's running all the way till the end of 2018, where you're being told if you have income that is outside Kenya that has not been taxed, you're told it's okay, just come and declare there is no taxes that you pay on it for the amnesty. So come, declare, but condition is you bring the money back to Kenya. So that's the condition. As long as you bring the money, we won't tax you, it's okay. You just come tell us how much you have. Eh? So I don't know how many people will take it up, but it's a good thing. Tell your relatives or any other person who has a business outside to come and bring it. And then there's the other aspect of tax transparency. Here is where we are looking at how transparent is your business, how transparent is your business model and how you're doing it. And then there's the whole issue of the tax morality debate. And for here, if we are to bring it home is, I'm sure most people usually look at church institution and say these people should be paying taxes, yeah? Because you're saying you can't be making all this money and not paying tax. But it goes to the whole issue of, is it moral then, if you're making money and you're not paying taxes? Is it a moral thing? 
it's up for debate, yeah? But what you'll find is that even for churches now, what they're doing is they're setting up a separate institution to run their, the different businesses that they have so that they're not caught up in, bet in between. And then also in terms of cases handling, there's so many cases which have been going for to the tax appeal tribunal, which is a good thing. Because you know you have a right of appeal there. Eh? So, and if you feel like how the revenue authority is interpreting a certain law, you have a, ch you have a right to go to the tribunal. And that is what many people are doing. They're having the courage to say, you know what, I don't agree with your interpretation, and let's meet at the tribunal. And it is good because now we'll have more laws and more clarity in terms of how to do business. And then also there's the harmonization of county taxes. We all know at that time there was somebody who was charging taxes for, I think, for each head of chicken you have at the county level, you have to pay taxes, yeah? But at least it's changing now so that the county government just doesn't come up and say an outrageous form of tax, yeah? So that it's all harmonized and governed in the right way so that we don't feel overtaxed. And then just a takeaway, one thing as we are saying, comply. It doesn't hurt to comply, 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 yeah? Register for the correct tax obligation, file your returns on time, pay taxes on time. These are just the bare minimum. If you do, your life will never be the same, yeah? I'm not turning into a preacher. <laughs> Oops, sorry. And then understand what taxes need to be paid, yeah? And then you maintain proper tax uh, and accounting records. And when in doubt, please engage an advisor. When in doubt. When all things are failed, engage an advisor so that they can guide you. Yeah? And as uh, Benjamin Franklin said, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Thank you very much. Two minutes for any questions that can be found through the session. We have a hard stop. One. Any? Yes. So, in terms of the tax amnesty, my understanding is that only income is directed to Kenya, as a tax in Kenya. For instance, if I own an apartment in London, the rest of the income I pay for the tax there. So, in terms of actual income that I earn outside of Kenya, but the revenue going to just be coming back from Kenya, which are these specific incomes that I can then have back. Thank you for that. So, the question I will have when you are purchasing that apartment, the revenue that you had to purchase that apartment, was that revenue that was supposed to be taxed in Kenya originally? If it was inheritance and we know it wasn't taxable, then that's okay. The scenario we're looking at it, for example, in, as an, a tax resident person and I'm employed, I'm supposed to be taxed on my worldwide income. Meaning, if I'm employed here in Kenya, but still being paid from UK, from all the other countries, all that revenue I'm supposed to generate is supposed to be taxed in Kenya. So if the revenue that I was supposed to receive from UK I don't declare it here, I use it to buy that apartment, then that apartment, the revenue that I'm generating from that apartment needs to be taxed here in Kenya because the initial revenue was not taxed in Kenya. Sorry? Yes? your earning interest, it goes back to the initial question, the original money. The know how to know whether the money was, is supposed to be taxed here, you have to ask yourself the initial source of capital. Was it taxed in Kenya if it was supposed to be taxed in Kenya? Because as you had said, yes, it's, if it is for business income, if the business was not registered in Kenya and it's a business in London, that's okay because Ideally, that income is not supposed to be taxed here in Kenya. It's supposed to be taxed in London. So for that one, you don't even have to utilize the amnesty. So we have to ask yourself, what's the source of the capital? 
Yeah. So the lady at the lady then we can come forward, yeah? So my question was what she does I'm going to be in Kenya. So I just hide the tax. You're a tax resident in Kenya. By tax resident I mean are you a Kenyan? So if you're a Kenyan, you're presumed to be tax resident if you're born in Kenya. So, and for employment income, even if you are getting that employment income from another jurisdiction, for employment income, if you are a tax resident, you have to tax it here. And what normally happens in such a situation, you would come, when filing your return, you say that this amount has already been taxed in another jurisdiction. But the mistake that is happening here is people don't come back and say, I have this foreign income. And for a situation, a person in your situation, what you'd normally just do is come, say, this is the employment income I had earned during this other duration, and declare it. And for that one, you won't be taxed. Yeah. What if at that time you apply for tax dormancy? No, no, no. They, with this one, there's no tax dormancy because we are looking at it, the actual tax to be paid, because you are still earning income. Dormancy is when there is no taxes to be paid. Yeah. So the memorandum of tax we talked about earlier, um, we only talk about it in terms of charitable organizations. But what about the political modality of tax? There are people who and I don't know if it's not a legal discussion, but there are people who feel based on conviction, um, and they have their question in light of money being misappropriated or government not spending your money the way you want it. And they feel like I'm convicted morally not to pay taxes. Thank you for that. You know, when you're looking at tax, it's very an, quite an interesting debate because for you and why most people don't comply is somebody says, I'm giving it to the government who do not meet the basic needs, yeah? There are certain jurisdictions who actually pay tax to the tune of 55%. But for them, they do not have to worry about education, even up to university level, they don't have to worry about all these other things. So yes, I do agree with you, there is another debate that needs to happen in terms of ask questioning the government, what are you doing with the funds? Because the funds that we, why we pay taxes, even morally or from a constitutional perspective, we pay the taxes to the government so that the government can give us services. So that's why even they need to be, you see the way in the morning, the, you have to leave the way for the top politicians and the top officers. Ideally, we have employed them, so they're the ones to leave the way for us. Yeah, that's a debate for another day. <laughs> but I do agree with you in terms of that debate. We pay taxes so that we can receive services from the government. Yes. Um, two the income tax bracket, is it the same as the pay like for me as an entrepreneur? Does it apply to me? And also, what's the actual process of pay in terms of which account, and how do you usually? When you say as an entrepreneur, you mean as a sole proprietor? Yes, sole proprietor, I mean, individual now, yeah. Yeah, if you're a sole proprietor, then you'll just do the calculation, and then whatever is there, you subject it to the, uh, to the, uh, to the bans, okay? To the tax bans, yes, yes. It's just that normally they're used for uh, pay -wise, but that's taxation for actually individuals. So if you're, if you're a sole proprietor, that's what will apply. The way you pay tax nowadays, you pay it on uh, ITAX. You just generate uh, something we call uh, a payment registration number. And then it just shows you uh, the, the different accounts that uh, KRA has. And uh, it will have accounts in basically all the banks. So you just send the instructions to your bank, and then the tax is paid. OK? Yes. Yes, if you are a sole proprietor. Yeah. Um, let me take this one, then I'll come to that side. As a registered uh, taxpayer, I'm trying to do my taxes through my tax, for example. And uh, as late comers as we are, on um, the last day, when it is due, I'm taking it away. Then I'm trying to submit. 
the site is down. Uh, the next day, the site is up. What is my place? Am I, am I Ideally, you will have no case, because eh? remember, um, for example, even for the filing of returns, let's say even employees or or uh, individuals, your year end is actually December, okay, and you need to file this return in June, on or before thirtieth June, okay. Unless you can show that, for example, if you're an employee, um, my employer actually gave me the P9 on the 29th or on the 30th on the dot, uh, it will be difficult. I mean, there's, there's a lot of time. It will be difficult to get away with that. You'll just be hit with the penalty. Actually, I am a, a trader, mm -hmm. trading on the credit of VAT uh, for 20 days. I think I've created a bill and I am submitting and they are not on the desk. Assuming that manually you are going to submit, I would have found an officer behind mm -hmm. the desk. Now, the officer here is down because it is the site. I think what KRA has probably tried to uh, to do with that, I don't know if you've uh, failed to file returns and then received uh, a notification which tells you, just file this return uh, by a certain date. They'll probably extend it to a week or so. There's those kind of notifications that you get. I think that's what they're doing to try and deal with some of those issues. Uh, and I think the question now here usually is uh, if I file the return then within uh, uh, within that period that they've extended, uh, does the penalty come in or not? Under the law, of course, the penalty kicks in. But since you, if you have that um, communication from them, they can actually be stopped from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, yeah, from penalizing you. So I think that's how they deal with it. And just to add on that, also, even if the penalty computes, still on ITAX, you can actually apply for waiver. And for some of my clients, I've just applied for waiver, and after 30 days, they come back and say waiver granted. Yeah. So okay. in, in a case where you've not applied for a waiver, but the penalty hangs on your head. You have to deal with it. So you have to apply for waiver or pay it. Yeah. So um, on ITAX, sorry, on ITAX, you can actually, you can do that online. You can do that online. All those things are The problem is, like, it doesn't go through. I've, I've tried. I've, I've tried to apply for a waiver because um, I, was, I was among the people who didn't file on 30th of you know, June, but I didn't get any communication from the I, I tried calling the number, but as in. Just, um, you still need, in as much as it's still online, eh? you still need to, if you know your station, just go and uh, speak to your station manager, yeah. Yeah. I have two questions. Yes. The first one is uh, on your mistakes, convention ignorance. And I'm assuming this within our session might not be enough for us to make business decisions. True. So where can we get all this knowledge? Mm -hmm. <laughs> not, not knowledge per se, but rather the content that would enable us to be more knowledgeable. That's the first question. The second one would be uh, there's a, there's a memory, it's a circular by KRA, that they're going to deactivate things by that. I had hoped you'd mention that in the trials. So would you care to comment on that? Um. The first question in terms of uh, where all this is contained, of course, this is tax law, so it's contained in the laws. But of course, uh, for those who are not lawyers, they find it difficult uh, you know, to read the laws. And I think that's where, as consultants, we come in. That's where we actually earn our con. So feel free to engage uh, after this. But uh, um, yeah, in terms of um, uh, that notification by the KRA, as far as I understand is that, uh, first of all, for those people who have not, um, who have not migrated, okay, who have not migrated to, uh, to ITAX, okay? So those ones will be deregistered because it will be assumed that you're actually not trading. The other uh, indication was that if you've not filed returns uh, for the past three months, so I would probably think if you have ticked any as you one obligations, any VAT uh, obligations which are required monthly, then they will assume if you've not filed the uh, the last three uh, the returns for the last three months, they'll assume that you've actually stopped trading. So 
just if you have those obligations, just file even if it's nil returns, and then you'll probably deal with the with the other issues later. So what happens is that there was there was a debate in terms of even what they are doing is not provided for in the law in terms of there's no section which says that if the pin is dormant, it should be deactivated. It's not there in the law. So that's why even it has been held off a bit because even some people actually went to court. But what would normally happen if they deregister you, then the only other thing to do is go back and register. And what they are trying to do, they want to deregister all of those, those people so that now if you, are, if you are deregistered and you want to register again and you want to use the same details, you will have to go to the offices because it will not accept now. So and when you go to the offices, they will ask you for the penalties for the time you never filed your returns. So it's more of a collection mechanism. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I think my suspicion is that they are, they are targeting especially those pins that are not yet on, on ITAX because basically they just need everyone on ITAX. So that's my suspicion. Yes? Uh, my question is that uh, how do uh, companies benefit from on the side of tax, uh, with the corporate social responsibility, is there a way they benefit? Um, uh, apart from, uh, you know, enhancing your image and, you know, just showing that you're actually uh, uh, responsible uh, in that aspect, uh, we did look at, I don't know whether you are in, we did look at uh, the aspect of donations and how you can actually be able to claim it uh, as an expense, and uh, there are certain requirements that you need you need to have. First of all, you have to be donating to uh, a respectable, ah, sorry, uh, a registered charitable organization. They need to have those certificates. They need to have, for example, uh, the exemption certificate, give you a receipt. If you do that, if you have all that, then you can actually uh, claim that as an expense, okay? So it, it doesn't become a cost to you. Then, of course, uh, there is also sponsorship where you can sponsor um, events. And in those events, if you are marketing, if you can prove that you are actually uh, marketing yourself as well, then you can claim that as a, as a marketing expense. And also to add on that, recently the, something new was introduced in terms of in case there is something that has been termed as national disaster. For example, at the beginning of the year, we had the issue of hunger which was termed a national disaster. So if your organization actually uh, donates to Red Cross, then uh, that donation is considered a normal business expense. And also there was, uh, they had the aspect of if you're sponsoring a team, uh, a sports team, then it's also considered a normal business expense, as long as the team must be those registered by their sports association, yeah, yeah. Thank you. The new pins, what about the new pins are not No, no, we mean migrating it to ITAX. Are you on ITAX? If you're on ITAX, it's considered you're okay. Yes, you're on ITAX, you're okay. Old pins, we mean those ones who you got them manually. Yes. We, we, yes, you have to migrate your pin to ITAX. Yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> Now, I, I mean, we could go on the rest of the day, but really have to stop. We've gone one hour over. Um, yeah, so the bad news is we need to stop now, just uh, for those of us who need to leave for other things. So we want to stop the formal session now. Um, however, if Lydia and Toddy are available, you can engage them one-on-one -on -one after this. Uh, I think what's clear is that we definitely need another session, um, either with Toddy and uh, Lydia or with... Um, uh, other people will figure that out as time goes by. Um, so please, yes, do engage, do engage um, Lydia and Toddy after this. They left their email address on the screen. I'm sure they can repeat it later. Uh, engage them one on one. Um, but also, as the IHUB, we will in the next couple of months be rolling out member services that will include engagement with tax experts, like um, whom we've had from today, with legal experts, with accounting experts, and so on. Um, and so now is a good time to actually sign up for membership of the IHUB. There's a minimum of 7,000 bob a month that gives you access to the space. So you can come in every day, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, take advantage of the space, of the Wi-Fi, of the connections, and then eventually also of the services that you'll be getting from, from experts. Um, if you didn't get everything that we went through today, don't, I mean, don't fall into depression and say, oh my goodness, I sat here for three hours and still I don't get it. 
Um, I think for me, that's the value of experts in different fields. And so you're an entrepreneur, be an expert at that and at your product, and then rely on partnerships and other experts to kind of fill in those gaps. So don't feel that from this session you should have gone out as a tax expert. That was not the expectation. But now you know the questions that you should be asking the experts or whoever that you, 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 know, you engage moving forward. Um, so please get more details on IHUB membership on ihub.co.ke or reach out to us, memberships at ihub.co.ke. Engage Lydia and Toddy up to this. And uh, we'll soon be sharing information on the next session that should be late September. So thanks for coming and have a great Saturday ahead.